What a perfect, perfect symbolic ending to LeBron's Laker career, hmm. possibly. Not the loss, just that at the end of the loss, he dominates the landscape by giving a non-answer to a question that is the only non-answer he can give that will result in us talking about LeBron <laughs> after he's been eliminated and other teams are headed to the second round because the league has been taken over by other people for the first time in a long time. It's a welcome change, but in the short term, it's going to be bad for the league. Not in the long term, but ratings this year, this is not good that all your stars are out and the league has been taken over and the next revolution is here. It, in the long term, it'll be good, but not, not this year. But... Before we go any further, Greg Cody damaged his face considerably. I don't know that I've had a friend, maybe Izzy Gutierrez, in my entire life that has had a face as busted up as Greg Cody's looked yesterday. And we have a song to commemorate. Uh, you love Jimmy Buffett. You recently saw a memorial concert uh, at the Hollywood Bowl because of how much you love Jimmy Buffett. So I imagine you will love this song. Tripping up <laughs> It's these deck shoes <laughs> This is a lovely bruise <laughs> Or maybe a faint Phantom of the Opera mask that you are presently wearing, uh, you bought for how much on Amazon? <laughs> I think it was um, one of those weird numbers, six dollars and thirty nine cents or something like that. Right. Yeah, but next day delivery, man, shows up in a little package, and when the package has my name on it, it just makes my heart flutter with joy because ninety nine yeah. percent of the packages we get have my wife's name on it. It does feel great to yeah. get an Amazon package, like to track the package from the warehouse to oh, your yeah. house. It's fantastic. I feel yes. special, right? Honestly, I know it's uh, why Bezos is the richest man in the world. God because, bless him. Uh, even worth after every penny. Give, even <sighs> after giving up fifty percent of his stuff, I mean, <sighs> yeah. I, I was still reacting to the God bless him part, not the yeah, worth every penny of it. Convenience, man. Mm -hmm. He's selling convenience. Look at you. I'm telling you. And this thing, it's as sturdy as flimsy plastic can possibly be. That's right. <laughs> We will have a reveal in a second here, but let's go back to yesterday because it has healed some since yesterday. Let's look at the the picture that we have of Greg Cody uh, that has been now, you know, that's been a day, and you've gotten all the clicks that you wanted from embargoing the information on what happened. You threatened to take Chris Cody out of your will if we took the clicks that you got from revealing how it is your eye got that way. 
But can you tell us now, for the people who have not heard the Greg Cody show featuring Greg Cody? With, yeah. Fine. Yeah, it's all over, man. It's all over the country. Um, well, I took a spill. I took a bad spill, and I face-planted on asphalt, Oof. and that's what happened. Did and you feel it coming? Did you No. Feel, like no. You just passed out from one second to the next without feeling like a wooziness or a lightheadedness? It was a coughing fit. Like that. He had a coughing fit, so he stepped outside like he does. And I'm pretty much done the chronic cough thing, but I did have a little bit of a coughing fit just before that, but I was not aware of fainting, of passing out, of, of falling. You know, one minute I'm walking to my car with my heavy bowling bag in my right hand, and the next minute I'm down on the floor barely conscious, and I say barely conscious because I'm, I'm uh, supine and hearing what sounded like disembodied, distant voices hovering over me. And thank God one of them was Christopher's voice. Hmm. Uh, that's something worth thanking God for. Okay. The, 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 the detail here that was here now that would have been worth giving the clicks to the Greg Cody show featuring Greg Cody because with yeah, yeah. Uh, of yeah. how truly pathetic a detail it is to have in the middle of this, you walking somewhere with a bag with your bowling ball. Yes. <laughs> 14 pounds. For your... Wow. Actually, I take that back. 15 Wow. Yeah. That's a big one. That's a big ball. Yeah. Yeah, yep. no doubt. Do a I lot mean, of damage. Yeah, you can. The ball okay? You know what? The ball's okay. All right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. For your weekly bowling match yeah. that represents the last vestiges of any athleticism or competitiveness that you still have in your soul. It's a league bowling thing. Christopher and I, it's a family league. It's Christopher and I, uh, his father-in-law, Michael. Uh, and then a family friend. It's it's a wonder. I look forward to that weekly bowling league like none other. Dan, that's unfair. Have you seen this man kick field goals? I mean, thank that's you. True. You're welcome. Thank uh, you. Steve I guys. have, and he hurt seven himself. years ago. And he hurt oh, himself. I mean, well, that I mean, there's nothing you can do to prevent injury. He, right. I know, but ex that would end his athletic career. I said the last vestiges <laughs> Some thought of his would athletic end. career, right, and he well. comes back with the. Let me make a correction here from yeah. seven years ago when Greg injured himself trying to kick a field goal that ended his athletic career yeah but he's still out there bowling mm -hmm. i mean and, and, right. and, and bowling requires athleticism mm -hmm. and believe me yeah. put it on the poll please juju does bowling require athleticism believe me Hell that's yeah. norm duke. Duke show. Yeah. that's right <laughs> the duke how'd you bowl that day i think i think that the most important question how did i bowl um my bowling game is is mediocre you're about a 150 right I'm I, about a 150 i am exactly a 150 average and, you know, I'm capable of bowling a 200. I'm also capable of bowling a 112. You know, so I'm all over the map. Very inconsistent. Chris Cody, can you please play the Lord song of the last time where we buried Greg Cody's entire career as an athlete? I've never seen Cody in the flesh. But he sounds like he's 80 years old. I know he's not proud of how he dresses. And a 70s haircut But on the show he's like Knuckleball, curveball I can hit a home run Kershaw, Verlander Don't matter who is throwing I don't care I'll hit them 400 feet in air And then Greg Cody's like I can take D. Wade and Bosch on the double team Find the open man And even if they're guarding me I don't care I'm draining threes from everywhere And I can kick field goals field goal. Like my idol for I'll hit from 50 yards at least Even though I'm missing PATs I'm good enough to place wagers, wagers. And win the money from Labatard And then I'll Ow! I think I just pulled my quad You, you did actually pull your quad, right? I did, it? yeah That yeah. was uh, an injury that required what doctor's care, did it not? It well, they took me into the trainer's room at St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Chris Carter heckled you. He was Chris mocking Carter you. Chris Carter did yeah. heckle me. You're CC, right. Yeah. I'd forgotten about that. Nice uh, detail there. But uh, no, that quickly healed. I'm going to tell uh, the audience, I'm putting all the Heat and Panther stuff in the local hour. You will find it uh, an hour from now. Uh, at the moment, I want to cover some of the stuff from last night. So local hour is officially an hour from now? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. I'm just, you know. That's official. It's been... 
everywhere. Yeah. Mm. How dare CC mock you? What do you think he bowls now? All he does is catch touchdowns. I mean, Man. yeah, that's true. Does he bowl? I don't know. I challenge him. I challenge Chris Carter to a bowl. Wow, off. wait, hold on. Look straight at the camera and do that. <laughs> I, You'll find I, it. I challenge him to a bowl well, off. If you're listening, wrong Chris. Camera. Here, just hold on a second. Let's see which he camera. He looks so which, menacing. Which in that. Yeah, here. Uh, I think it's which, in the, the wooden <laughs> thing here. All right, right here. This wooden that's thing right it. here. No. Go ahead. There we go. Uh, right there. Now, you talk to Chris Carter so that we can send this to him. Chris Carter. I want you on a bowling lane, you and me, man to man. Wait a minute. Baby. Wait a minute. That sounds like you've offered to Hold have on. him, to take him, to desire him right. on a bowling I lane. I am going to kick his ass on oh. a bowling lane. Kick. That's right. Because it sounded like you wanted him to lay down on the bowling eh, lane. you got a dirty mind. Let's try it again, just in case. He yeah. Misunderstood. One more yeah. time. CC. Take two. Yeah. Yeah. Chris Carter. That's you, the wrong, camera. wrong, camera. wrong camera. camera. Chris Carter, you mocked me <laughs> when I pulled a hamstring trying to kick field goals at St. Thomas Aquinas, and now I challenge you to a game of bowling. I have no idea why, but I <laughs> challenge you to a game of bowling, just you and I, $1,000 to the winner. Whoa! Wait, what? Who's, Did fronting? I just say that? Who's fronting that? Yeah, Dan's going to front me on that. No. All no? he does is throw strikes. Mr. No. Meadowlark. <laughs> no. Mr. Meadowlark is going to uh, uh, put up my $1,000 bill. Do you guys do the same thing when you hear the name? Well, he called it Fouad Revez. I thought it was, I've always pronounced it Fouad Revez. Yeah. Same, yes. Right. But uh, do you guys go the same place mentally than I do? Because there's only one place I go with the fraud, uh, when I hear the name Fouad Revez, and it is not football, field goal kicking, or being good at, at, at anything that he was good at that I knew about. It's something he was good about good at that I didn't know about, which is that the Vikings had a defensive tackle, John Randall, that everyone in the league was kind of scared of. He was terrifying. He would celebrate his sacks by crawling around and pretending to urinate like a dog on uh, the quarterback. And uh, John Randall was a menace in his own locker room. And one day he went after Fouad Revez, uh, Fouad Revez, yes. who then ended up putting tomato, him tomato. in like a figure. Do you pronounce the Z? Actually, I think it's just Fouad Revez. Huh. Uh, was he French? I don't know how to pronounce this man's name. I put a Z on there. Fouad Revez. Revez. Fouad Revez. Chavez Ravine. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Regardless, John Randall was locked up in the <laughs> locker room in a way that he had to tap out because the kicker. Oh, you have that story. Excellent. I didn't know you had that story. I heard on Friday from an informed source that Fra Fouad Revez, the kicker, reduced him to tears in the Vikings locker room. Fouad, true <laughs> or untrue? <laughs> Well, let me, let me say this. It is true to a certain degree. It's true in that he became he, – he always liked to just jump on people from behind and just give them a hard time. And he did that to me, and being that I was a, a former wrestler, uh, and uh, I was able just to wrestle my way into putting him into a lock, into a position that he could not get out of until he was able to uh, beg for me to let him go. So needless to say, from that day on, day on a lot of my buddies just gave him a really hard time. Begged, made John so Randall awesome. Beg. Wow! Yeah. Uh, let's go to last night, Stugatz, because a handful of interesting things happened uh, during the day. A report comes out that the Lakers are open to drafting Bronny to keep LeBron around. Funny. It is funny. <laughs> He's going to be able to make a decision as the oldest player in the league that gives him options and allows him still to do what he wants to do because still he is somehow his own economy and then they lose last night to Denver Denver is a worthy champion and I would say to you LeBron James lost last night but LeBron James doesn't generally deserve to lose his team is very good he's still very good he ran into a champion last night, and the champion finished him because Jamal Murray is now getting into these situations where he's been in enough of these games that he could be the second option that makes the shot because everybody's worried about the other guy. And when I say the other guy, Stugatz, I want to ask the group here. Tom Brady's the standard in all of sports for 
people had no idea how good he was going to be. How could no one who's an expert at football know that was going to be good? But I think this is the standard in basketball now. This guy in Denver. Jokic. Uh, uh, not, not throughout sports, but in basketball, a guy who made everyone look like a fool because how could you not know that he was this good? How can nobody know that there was a guy who didn't deserve to be drafted in the first round, who was going to become as dominant as anyone you've ever seen. And in the game last night, he's the guy you know is going to win. You know his team is going to win because he makes excellence look boring. I'm asking you, Manu Ginobili used to be someone like this, who made it the Hall of Fame from the second round. Uh, the Spurs were said to be good at this, but I don't think... I can find anything in basketball hmm. that vaguely resembles close to what do you mean one of the best players ever? Nobody had any idea he was going to be any good. Nobody had any idea that he'd be a starter in the league. Like, how is that even fundamentally possible when you have experts analyzing sports all over the place? Even the Manu comps, um, while well, I see why you go there, it was just a different time in the NBA where it was harder to sign those guys. So Jokic was more of a true eval at his draft spot. It's, it's considering the resources that go into NBA and how just different it is to scout that, it, you could stack up where he was drafted. Not It's not quite Tom Brady's six-round tier, but it's actually pretty close when you consider how much the NBA has developed their, their scouting arms. But to Dan's point, this is a second round pick. It's not Dennis Rodman. He has a different skill set. And I'm and now that I'm thinking about it, how did every team miss on it? Like the fact that he might turn into one of the great players we've ever seen because that size with that skill set. Yeah, drafted though. The game was also I headed know. very clearly headed in a different direction. And you could understand how people weren't exactly sure how he'd fit into it. Now he fits into it like a glove. Well, uh, when you say the sport it was headed in a different way or different place positionless, this part's fascinating to me. The Boston Celtics suffered an injury last night that will end them if he cannot play against the teams in the West because the four top seeds in the West can all beat the Celtics, but the Celtics are better with Porzingis. But they need Porzingis. They need... They have Horford. The, the, if they, no, they have Horford, but they've got a real size problem if they go into the deeper into the postseason and have to face Denver have to face Jokic with a size problem. Like, you don't want hard. Someone uh, ends up beating the Nuggets. It'd be shocking to me, just given what we've seen recently. No one's really had an answer for him. How do you go about stopping them? I'm asking because I'm genuinely curious because I don't pay that close attention to the sport to know or even comprehend what the book is on stopping Jokic. This year's team is actually better than last year's team that won the NBA championship. And the reason I say that, Mike, you and I have talked about this guy for a while, but he's finally coming into his own. Michael Porter Jr. is the reason the Nuggets no, are a better no, Dan. No, I disagree. He was with you. so good I, last Stugatz, night, and he's been so good Stugatz, all season. This is where I disagree with you. Okay, uh, Michael Porter was good all of last season, and then was was the worst starter in the finals. That team is not as good as it was last year because Bruce Brown and Jeff Green matter, and their bench is light and young. That, that team isn't as good as it was last year. It is still very good. Minnesota can beat them. Can you guys look up for me the box scores of the last series Minnesota and Denver played against each other last season? Because Minnesota is also a good deal better. And Anthony Edwards is here for stardom. And Rudy Gobert does have the kind of size that somehow doesn't get taken off of the court now in the first round. And Minnesota can absolutely beat Denver. But... Denver last night, what they did with Jamal Murray, had LeBron James after the game. I want to play this sound because, Stugatz, this question is so easy to answer if you actually have made your mind up and don't want to create the hysteria that he's going to create by specifically answering it this way. This might be the end of his career. This might be what it, the Laker career. And this might be what it sounds like, because this is what the endings have sounded like every time he leaves. Tonight, was there any thought at all that, you know, this could have been your last game with the Lakers? Um, I'm not going to answer that. Appreciate it. What a 
perfect final act. Well done. Mm. Yeah. The pause, the pause said more than the no comment. The no comment said more. Yeah. Than, smirk. <laughs> they, they, there were three things he did there where, where it's like, yeah, if I'm going to go into my offseason, I'm going to do the move where I neuter some of the criticism on television tomorrow morning by getting them to talk about the transaction and my next stop. I'm going to, t- I'm going to turn the volume down just a little bit on how much they criticize me for for leaving or for for losing because I'm going to titillate them with leaving. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's so good. It's and, such a good move. It's a veteran move by him. And almost immediately come the leaked reports. The the Lakers are open to drafting Bronny uh, and 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 giving LeBron what he wants at this stage in his career. And I gotta say, just just because you're accomplished and you want to bring your family along, that's kind of whack, no? Yeah, but it's the ultimate power, like the you know the ultimate flex. It's just you're you're long in the tooth. You've no, had Mike, a nice career in your industry, and you insist on on bringing a family member around. It's just, I I could never. Mike, he's forty years old. He's going to be forty years old. If he could convince an NBA team to draft his son, who has no business being drafted in the first round, that's the ultimate Mike, flex. But Mike's right, though. It's unprofessional. Mike's right. Uh, you, you shouldn't do that. No, no one. one no one thinks it. he's no as good as as you do because you're just related. No one wants to see this. You're biased just because you love the person. It's not about their qualifications. It's not about merit. That's supposed to be a meritocracy. Sports is supposed to be a meritocracy. He's LeBron has talked for ten years about wanting to play with his child. Yep. This is this you is shouldn't not work a, with your you shouldn't work. Tom Izzo with played his son. Father. You I mean, I agree. It's nepotism. You know, you shouldn't work with your son. Uh, you got here a little late, Greg. We were, all, we were already doing that. <laughs> it was there really more a, of a barb at Dan. No, no, I took it. I absorbed it. <laughs> the and reverse re- Nepo. And, the, and, no, I, and then I realized, I, knew, I saw it was directed at me, but while I did it, I was staring at Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and so, I was like, why am I on the camera right now? <laughs> but, but last night, Stugantz, I'm, I'm telling you, the Lakers are good, and he's still good. Like that's oh, he's great. Yeah, he was really yes. good. He was Wonderful. really good down the stretch, yep. going going to the cup, getting Aaron uh, Aaron Gordon out of position, and taking advantage of that, going to the line, doing the LeBron things, and you realize that even if it's not Jokic making the buckets on the other end, his presence just absorbs so many bodies out of there that Aaron Gordon can win a one-on-one against LeBron James and rip it away from him. Or he can go up and get it himself and turn a mediocre possession into one that they get two to three points on. And Jamal Murray's finally... And he, he's getting healthier and healthier with each passing season. I don't know if he's ever going to be bubble Jamal, but to be the he's exactly what they need to be that guy... Down the he wasn't stretch. supposed to play yesterday. He was begging him to play. He should have sat out. Yep, hit the game winner. I have some advice for LeBron James. Me and Greg were talking before the show. I think this is a great final act because, Dan, when you think back at his career and you think about what he's chasing and who he's chasing, and that's Michael Jordan, of course, LeBron has won championships in the South. He has the South covered. He has won in the Midwest. He has Middle America covered. He has one out west with L.A. He has the West Coast covered. Whoever loses between the Knicks and Celtics, okay, in the Eastern Conference Championship is where LeBron goes. Because if he goes to one of those teams, okay, and he helps them win a title, Boston, can you imagine? He wins one in L.A. and one in Boston. Perfect. Or the Knicks. Yes. Oh, my goodness. I think people, Dan, he would have the entire country covered, and I think people might start saying that he was better than Michael Jordan. Yes. How about that? Stugas is right. The king of New York, LeBron, the king of New York, Yeah, that's the apex of, of, of a mountainous career. Yeah. I just want to really be clear on Stugas's takes on this because he can be wi- wildly, wildly, wildly yeah. inconsistent. Mm-hmm. Uh, you didn't want him on the Knicks when I asked you six weeks ago. You right. simply right. flatly stunned me by saying you didn't want him on the Knicks. I, I, hold on. Just okay. hold, on. Well, hold on. That was then. Just hold on. Okay. Yes, that was then. And now you are saying, I've been saying, meaning you, for the entire time LeBron's been alive, he's not as good as Michael Jordan, but he will be if he comes to my team. No, not his team per se. Mm-hmm. The well, region. Well, no. But, region. Yeah, but yeah. New York. He said Bo- he well, lost Boston. No, but there. Dan's right. I was thinking Knicks. If, but he has to win one. That's right. They have to lose, so, and he so has the, to win the, one. So yes. only winning one for you will make him better. Winning one for me is like winning 10. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Pablo Torre is going to be here in a moment. He is tackling a topic on the next Pablo Torre finds out that I believe 
everyone in this room will be interested in. As soon as I present to you the subject matter, uh, I happen to be talking about the thing he's doing in the kitchen with a few of my friends recently. It's a story from 1973 in sports that I would love to happen today just to see how people reacted because I am certain you guys are going to be interested in the subject matter. At some point during the show today, we are going to reveal whatever it is that Greg Cody's face looks like now. (laughs) He wants us to do it now because he's finding the $6.39 purchase on his face to be uncomfortable. And so he wants to take it off now. Should we just get it over with because we've got a couple of uh, I'm going to say un- anticlimactic announcements to make around here today because yeah. Stugatz has botched another thing and he's taking advantage of the fact that nobody is in charge around here anymore that uh, all of a sudden Mike Ryan has left his position to just snort hockey all the time and now uh, Stugatz got, you know l- l- he ran Witty out of here because Witty was just tired of loved everything about the job except trying to corral Stugatz he's going to make Billy fundamentally insane. I mean, Witty would wake up one morning expecting me to be in studio and I'd be at Shoreline Amphitheater watching Dead and Company. <laughs> That's part of the problem. And uh, so last Love week, you, last week, because he needed a travel day to get to not Detroit. Mm-hmm. Detroit ish. Yeah. Detroit. He needed, that would have actually been a better way to do it. Detroit would have been a better way to do it than the way, I know that you did it parenthetically by putting the entire Troy in the way Tony did it, but the way that to- Greg just said it would have been the way to do it. Just Detroit. You know, I'm there for you. Like a faux Detroit. Funny. Yeah. F- Detroit adjacent. Uh, but Stugatz needed two days to get to not Detroit. Yep. So he had to be out Wednesday's show and Thursday's show. And before leaving Wednesday, he pulls me aside. Me, I'm not the planner, and tells me all the different ways that the book has to be announced last week and reveal the cover, and he's not going to be here and do it last week. Mm -hmm. And so I did it last week. You did? And now he wants to do it again today because he says today is the reveal of the bo- of the book cover, and I just don't think this is the way to make announcements. You weren't supposed to do it last week. I was just checking on inventory. I was making sure the cover was here. I was making sure the book is here, and it's here, uh, and I was going to make an announcement. And so you weren't supposed to do it last week, Stugans. but I appreciate Stugans. that you did it, and you're about to do why, it again. Why How would, about that? Why, bang for my buck. Why would I do it last week unless you told me? Like why? Why would why would I announce something well, with the cover and formally and bring it out and do the whole thing yeah, if you hadn't point. told me to do that while you were away? And except you weren't supposed to do it so early, and and today was the day we were supposed to. I was it. waiting for a co-author to be here with me, and I have one in studio. His name is Greg Cody. Thank I mean, you. Still waiting on your forward, by the way. It's a great looking book. Thank you. And it is. That that cover is spectacular. Yeah, what did great. you uh what did you have to pay the league to yeah. license the yeah. Lombardi trophy? We mentioned this last week, Stugatz. We think you have a liability issue here that you don't know about. That huh. you've just done some things that you can't just sell uh as as if it's I don't know how you got a licensing agreement with the four major sports. I oh, think the is. good people at Random House who have been at this for quite some time, they know what they're doing. I mean, I have a That's book true. deal with Random House. That's true. That would argue the other point then. <laughs> Plus, if you look real fair, Billy. <laughs> fair, Billy. Nice. If, you, if you look real closely on the football trophy, there it says Lombardi Trophy. Like they get around it by just slightly misspelling Lombardi, Detroit. which is brilliant. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> Vince Lombardi. Also, that's not scale on the trophies, but that's nitpicking. Hmm. You're going to critique the cover? Well, it's just we all know that Lord Stanley is much larger than the Lombardi Trophy. Now, if you want to make the Lombardi Trophy the same size as Lord Stanley, I'm all for that, but it's just not accurate. What's the announcement? Is it just what the cover looks like? So the announcement is now through Thursday, okay? If you go to StugatzBook.com and you pre-order the book, you're going to get an autographed copy. You're also going to get a special insert, a decal. It's very cool. Instead of a book worm, it's a book snake. How about that? Oh, that's, a, yeah. that's very clever. Yep. If the World Series trophy were the same size as Lord Stanley, it would have impaled somebody by now. That's true. You're hung up on this. It would have poked somebody's eye out. It's just right. very. It, there's a reason why, practically, it is the size that it is. But if you're a personal record book, you, unless in your personal record book all the trophies are all the same size. Uh, Billy had a great idea yesterday, and perhaps I don't know. I wish I would have done this, but 
all the people that contributed, Greg Cody being one of them, Mina Kimes, Tim Kirchin, I thank all of them, Stan Van Gundy. Billy wants all their names on the cover of the book, but he wants them in order. Like the biggest name at the top, the smallest name at the bottom. Biggest name is in most famous? Yes. I, I, I suggested to him that he says by Stugatz and, and then just yes. a series of ands, and they just continue to they get, get smaller, smaller as smaller. they go down on the <laughs> yeah. front of the book so that it looks like it was by all, of, which it was by all of these people. Yeah. And then you're also like going to upset whoever it is their name is last. That's a in the great smallest. idea. That's a better cover than the one that we're announcing. Right. No, but that's a nice no one cover, asked. though. Right. Yeah. No one asked Billy. Stugatz, that's better than this. Are you sure? Well, perhaps I'll find a place for it. I that's mean, a funny joke to go. And are I know. you is, is the smallest name? Are you going to insult somebody by making the yeah. smallest name the most famous name? Like if it said Dan Lebitard as the smallest name, or Greg Cody is like, what's the funniest joke to make the the final name in the smallest print? Well, know? that's what we were working on: is who would Mine? be the smallest name. <laughs> Stugatz decided that his he, name. Yeah, he's going to have Andre Dawson be the smallest name. No. He's that's the MVP nice. of this book. I am telling you. I wrote a chapter about how Andre Dawson has absolutely, absolutely no reasons to be to have an MVP. You cannot have an MVP and be in a last place team. You can't do it. And so I called my friend Andre and I told him my take and I asked him to write a rebuttal. And did he ever? Well, uh, he took a bat to my head, Dan. Ev everything there is true except for the part where Stugat says I wrote a chapter. Well, what did you what did you <laughs> say to Andre Dawson? They're my takes. What did you say to also him? Also, the my friend part. Well, That's I said, hard. Andre, uh, I need you to do me a favor. I wrote a chapter. It's called no, no. How did you thank him when he sent you that lovely chapter? Well, I sent him a. Uh, I told him he's not the real MVP. Like I said, you're the MVP of the book, but you're still not the MVP of the National League for the Cubs. That's what I said to him. Billy, <laughs> can I? I I know that Hawk we, got right back to me. I know that we have a long history of Stugatz just doing truly, you know. Shameless. Felt like Billy was setting him up for something. For a story there, he told and... me yesterday, which is he said that he told me, like, oh, thanks, Andre. I love this. You did the great job. Also, you still shouldn't be the MVP. Well, that's what I did. Yes, that's what I just said. I mean, he's not the MVP. I mean, that team won like 47 games. You, you, hold on. Thank me, you for writing hold, a chapter hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let me just explain. Dan, you can't be let an MVP on a last place team. Hold on. Let me explain to the Can't audience. write a chapter. Did you send him a carafe of embalming fluid to thank him? Let me explain to the audience what just happened. Mike Ryan and Billy are tossing to Stugatz a story that says all over it for everyone to see, hey, Stugatz, be Stugatz and tell the Stugatz story. And yeah. Stugatz forgets how to be that Stugatz because he's too busy being I'm an author. this Stugatz, yeah. famous author mm -hmm. of a book, and getting to the story I was getting to, yeah. of all your shameless acts, right. and there are legions of them. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there's one that runs through me quite as icky as the idea that I'm pretty sure the only time you talked to Andre Dawson or in any capacity was at my wedding. Yeah. And that you asked him to do this for no pay mm -hmm. while insulting him is just one of the great shameless acts. And now that you will profit off it while not paying him and call him your friend, it's just it's delightful book snakery. Everybody, go to StugatzBook.com where you can get all the kind of true stories told by others about Stugatz. Well, thank you for the great promotion, Dan, and the kind promotion. I appreciate it. Uh, he said yes. He did it with a smile on his yes. face, and I've done way worse. I know, but just— I mean, Mike Breen was on hold during Stupidity while I went over to interview Jake Paul. I mean, he thought my electricity went out. <laughs> Jake Paul, minus 180. Against Mike Tyson. Really? I, uh, really? I've been I got wanting Tyson. to bet Tyson. Big money on Tyson. Yeah, that, that line's actually come down. Yeah. yeah. Last I saw. But you saw now it's a sanctioned fight, so maybe that changes the math a little it's bit. It's a sanctioned heavyweight fight, and I did want to ask you about this because I think it's going to be a giant thing. And I've been fascinated by the stuff Netflix is doing. I don't know when this Tom Brady roast is. This Sunday. Yeah. This Belichick's one of the roasters. Is he really? Yes. Belichick <laughs> is one of the roasters. Yep. Edelman, Gronkowski. Uh, Belichick, I think Drew oh, Bledsoe man. is in there. I, this is okay. So now you're putting some expectations on it for me. Um, I hope uh, I hope they don't patriot it by being 
the you Patriots. want Belichick to be well I just right. I mean they're attempting comedy right they're they're the roast is a great format I would love to see what Tom Brady is doing with all of his branding the rest of his career I've told you guys that I'm fascinated like I'm hugely fascinated by the economy of Tom Brady versus LeBron James Peyton Manning over here hey late let's make stuff I bet you I can do something late in career where I might be able to make more money than I made playing. Let me make stuff. And you know what else I'll make? A whole lot of money because I'm competing against LeBron and Peyton and all of these guys who are now fighting at the top of sports. These guys, so God, it's so fascinating what's happening in this business. These athletes who have stormed it, all of them realizing, wait a minute, I could just use my fame in a microphone and Paul George has got something on the side yep. where he doesn't need any media ever again for anything because he's got his own platform and can speak directly to his fans and he's figured out what Draymond Green has while still playing. Let me go get that money now because holy there's more money after, as Shaq and Barkley will show you, than there was playing. The athletes don't need us anymore. We talked At about all. this 10 years no, ago. But, they don't need but, us. So the part that's fascinating about the making of stuff, Jake Paul is the younger version of this. He's just made a giant event in boxing. He created that from the sewer. Like, that's all self-made. That's YouTube. Yeah. And he's, he's going to fill a football stadium in Dallas fighting someone, and we're going to watch. And boxing has now become, whether you like it or not, it's circus freak town. This is what we want. Not the boxing fan. Not the purist. No, the spectacle. And young person, Jake Paul, about a thousand miserable, questionable things around him, but very little governance, fights Mike Tyson. And people are going to watch it. And I find it interesting. And I've got a very strong chance of being hugely loud wrong. Because I, wanting to believe in 57-year-olds, because I'm almost one of them, <laughs> might be underestimating that the betting odds are, hey, Jake Paul's young and strong and kind of a good boxer. <laughs> but I'm like, it's Tyson. Right. I would not fight him at 90. He could be in hospice dragging a dialysis machine, and he will strangle me to death with its cords. Well, your logic is winning out because when this line first opened, it, it was really inflated in, in Jake Paul's favor. Super inflated. This is not just some old guy. This is the 57-year-old guy anywhere in the world whose fists I would fear more than anybody's. I've been telling you that Pablo Torre is consistently finding that at the end of his curiosities, there are a whole bunch of things that a lot of people would be interested in knowing more about. And I was just saying before he came on with us here that just this weekend with a group of people, I was talking about something that happened in 1973 that if it happened today would be truly amazing. But it happened 50 years ago, and now he's doing a story on that thing. And Pablo, go ahead and tell the crew, because I told all of them that they're going to be interested in the subject matter. Tell them what it is that you, uh, you're putting out in public. Yeah, it's the Yankee wife swap story, which I think Greg, as he adjusts his phantom mask, may have a flicker of recognition for. But say, um, say, say that phrase again, wife swap. Wife swap, the Yankee wife swap. And you should know that the wife swap part of this undersells the swap. It's a real life story of something that happened in 1973, as you said, 50 years ago now. And it's about two starting pitchers for the New York Yankees, two best friends, two lefties, two guys who were truly together all of the time, who decided to not just trade wives. And I mean this in the most like uh, carnal and romantic ways. I also mean that they traded their kids. They each had two kids their pets, their furniture, their houses. Really, it was a husband swap, but they changed lives in the middle of their baseball careers. And this was just a thing that happened. And if you remember it, it is arguably the most bad, crazy thing that's ever happened in sports history, but it's been 50 years. And so I just got to, you know, uh, investigate and report out what happened then and after and since. And it culminates in a whole bunch of stuff that I think people probably are into. Um, purely, again, if you're into, like, crazy, bad gossip and also robots. Was I right when I said all of you would be interested in, in. learning slightly more about a 1973 wife swap story? 
Pablo's right. I remember it. Um, I had just been hired by the Fort Lauderdale Yankees to be their official scorer, even though I was only like 18 years old. Wow. And um, I remember at a spring training, um, Steinbrenner giving a big interview surrounded by reporters about <laughs> Kekich and Peterson swapping families. And it was the most surreal thing. I wasn't, you know, I didn't. I was covering high schools at the time. The story had nothing to do with me, but I peripherally, I remember the circus. And this is long before ESPN Sports Center. So you're right. Paul. We had a man on the ground. That you could have been a man on the ground because uh, yeah. you were around. Uh, he was there for at, that. At, at, right. You were there for that. We right. just hit the Greg Cody wheelhouse night. Put it on the poll, Juju at Lebetard Show. Are you stunned that the Greg Cody wheelhouse is a 1973 <laughs> story about wife swapping? Well, it's not like it wasn't covered at the time. But Pablo's right. Compared to how it would be covered today. It wasn't, that's for sure. Uh, so. Pablo Torre Finds Out is the name of the podcast. It's part of the Lebetard and Friends Network. I don't think, Greg, you realize how funny it sounds that because of your breathing and that mask, there's a huffing and <laughs> puffing quality acoustically to everything you're saying that's echoing off the inside of your mask. Yeah, I can appreciate that. And uh, whatever actor played the Phantom... I feel for that guy because this is hell on wheels wearing this mask. That actor did have a $5 mask from Amazon. If I, yeah, $6.39. Should we just Amazon. do the reveal so he should stop suffering? I need a ruling from the shipping container on this. Should we let what, – what's the payoff here? Because the bruise isn't as bad as it was yesterday. I was hoping it would get worse. It did not. <laughs> really? Why would you hope that? Because he apologized to me earlier for it healing so quickly. I did. Yes. Just visually, not actually health-wise worse. I just wanted it to look a little worse and then everything to get better because it'd make for better content yeah well two days three days ago my right eye was circled by blood red i looked like a raccoon but but it was blood red around my right eye and ah. the healing powers of the human body are pretty remarkable and now it doesn't look nearly as bad all right well then just reveal it so we can get on with what's <laughs> happening here uh and just uh, be done with it Okay, there's, uh. there's the anticlimax of that. Ta da! Yes, there it is. No, I mean, uh, it's. Should have just kept oh, the mask. Wow. Oh, wow! Yeah. It, it's healing. Wow. So. Oh, Danny, happy now? Yes, better. <laughs> Wait, better. better. Can, we, can you create a t shirt with Greg's face and the caption is, The, hu the healing powers of the human body are remarkable? <laughs> <laughs> He's hideous. <laughs> He's hideous. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Pablo, there are a number of different things that I want to talk to you about, but one of them is the back uh, page of the New York Post, Joel Embiid and everything happening in New York, because uh, Miami fans have something to be happy about in the next uh, couple of rounds. Either Boston or New York is guaranteed to lose. <laughs> is Pablo a Sixers fan or a Knicks fan today? I don't know. Let's okay. see where we are with all of this, Pablo. Uh, take us through this back page cover. Yeah, so uh, Joel Embiid, if you're not familiar, as we wait for the back page to pop up here, Joel Embiid, uh, his body feels like Greg's face looks. So he's not he's not well right now, okay? Um, but the most hated man in New York is the uh, is the big 200-point font on the back page of the Post. Knicks fans said to tell Embiid how they really feel. Um, and at this point, it just feels like bullying. I'll, I'll, I've spent the weekend reflecting on how I've been handling this story, and I have criticism for Embiid in a way that makes me feel like a guy who turned heel. That's what Mina told us, uh, Dan, Dan and me, on our, on our group chat. Um, what an incredible heel turn for Pablo to start killing Joel Embiid and get all these Sixers fans mad at him. And at this point, when I say to you, okay, that Joel Embiid had one point in the fourth quarter of this last game, that he had zero rebounds in the fourth quarter of the previous game, that in the first two games he had zero rebounds, um, I believe in the second half, um, or whatever it is. Lots of zeros when it comes to that guy. Um, he had one point in the fourth quarter. Um, so, look, to me, it's just stating the obvious. And the fact that he is the most hated man in New York feels like this city's appreciation for a punching bag, for a pinata. It feels like it's pinata season on Joel Embiid. Pablo, so I this is for this, him, but Pablo, come on. look, this is what is so great, fascinating, humanizing about all the storytelling that is in sports that's so wonderful. New York Stugatz is about to get so obnoxious. Yes. So obnoxious. Yep. And in comes the guy uniquely qualified in body type and 
character to handle to, no not to handle this just to be a troll and after three years of my body works perfect and look here chop i'm bigger than everyone chop and all he is is a troll and he's welcoming the fight but now he's got bell's palsy stugats his face is drooping his he can't blink his left eye he should be wearing a phantom mask i thought you were talking about taylor we're going to go to Taylor. He's on a train. He's almost <laughs> arrived at Madison Square Garden. But Insane. what's about to fall on Embiid's head, Pablo? This is the place where people are made into either heroes or crushed under it. Because I would not want to be him headed into that. Yes, the power, the superpower of New York, the real thing New York City can sell is that it has the spotlight that actually melts people. It's a thing. That building specifically, more than Yankee Stadium even, that building is a spotlight. You shine on people, and you see whether you can actually destroy them. And Joel Embiid in the fourth quarter, the reason I say the fourth quarter is because it is a proxy for pressure. And pressure has never felt more palpable than in the garden when it's sold out and the Knicks are onto something. No, and they're onto and, it. No, and, and... They just trampled your building so that after the game, you're saying you're pissed off because New York, hey, wasn't Philadelphia sports town. Stugatz, I would not want to be Joel Embiid. My body doesn't work right. The stress is in my face. It doesn't allow my left eye to blink. New York is coming for me, and I don't know what to do about their little guy. And then they start offensive rebounding, and I can't get Hartenstein off my back. Like, I wouldn't want to be him tonight, and these are the nights. Hey, Joel, MVP, can you put up 50 even though your body doesn't work? I mean, I understand what you're saying, but Joel Embiid's going to be fine either way. I'm just saying it would scare me is all I'm saying. I understand, but Joel Embiid lives in this place where if he wins, great. We'll celebrate Stugatz, him tomorrow. And if he loses, no one's going to blame Joel Embiid is what I'm because saying. he'll blame everyone Stugatz, else. He cares very much. He's playing the way that he is because his body is broken. Yep. No human being with their body in this condition would want this set of circumstances falling on their head. It depends you, on the athlete. You could be Some athletes welcome this. Uh, okay, Michael but, but welcome not, this. Not if your body doesn't work right, Stugatz. You remember not, the flu game? Not if the Bell's palsy is in your face. It's a stress disease. I understand. But the great athletes, they look forward to tonight, to shutting up that crowd. Say whatever you want. I'm going to shut you up. We're going I, back to Philly know, for game I, six. And I am telling you, as we sit here today, I'm not as brave or strong as the great athletes. I would fall apart under these conditions. Okay. But what I'm saying is that I've watched Joel Embiid now for almost a decade. And I have not seen... And this is the criticism I have of him. He has not risen to those moments. I got people really mad at me because I said he needed to step up in a big game. And, of course, he scored... He's, he has... The greatest postseason resume this postseason of his entire career. He scored 50 the other night. And that is still true alongside the fact that at the end of a game, it doesn't look like he is seizing the moment. And I get it. This makes me sound like a sport. Every Philadelphia uh, sports fan, I suppose, which I count myself as in the you know last decade um, for the Sixers. We turn into sports radio callers because by the end of it, you're just yelling at your television and saying to somebody, be better. And yet with Joel Embiid, I do think that he has not shown a comfort under pressure. And when you're the guy who's the troll, when you're the guy who is so, who is so fun because you look like you don't give up. The fact that you look like you're giving every single F. Sorry, Roy. That's the problem now. Is that, oh, right, you're the opposite of your brand now. You look scared and broken. And the latter, I understand physically. The former is what makes me want to call into a radio station. It's fascinating, just storyline from the idea that if you're watching this the way Pablo is, from the start of the process, this is 15 years of Northeast basketball. Mm -hmm. New York hasn't mattered for 15 years. Philadelphia has been building, and all they have to show for losing on purpose and embarrassing themselves is this broken thing that now falls under the light of the magnifying glass when the sun is burning ants. It's like, you're what's left of this. Go save it in Madison Square Garden under impossible conditions. Except you're the best player on the floor. You're the MVP. Yes,
Yes. You're this is where these stories get made, Stu You're guys. calling these impossible conditions. He has a great number two in Maxi. The team is good. They made a mistake with Jimmy Butler over to I'm Butler. talking about his body, Stu guys. I, I get, Dan, I'm, I'm, I get the body part. But you Joel, don't, though, is what I'm saying. You don't. He's still playing at a very high but, level, even while broken. I, I know, but you're asking him to play at a higher level. Yep. Flu game. Okay. It's like watching a seven-foot Greg Cody play center. That's what Joel Embiid has been like all year. Thank you. I don't know if that's a compliment. It is. I'm sitting right in the middle, Stugatz, of a hugely weird sports time in South Florida. Yeah. The pandemic made everyone crazy. The last five years of, like, pressing the gas on sports. We're just going to give you – we're going to inundate you with all things in sports – there's been an era of heat basketball played over the last five years. And we have burned through the Jimmy Butler years. The, the last 15 years, listen to what I'm going to tell you here. The last 15 years of basketball has been dominated by LeBron James, and he's given us 20% of what his economy is. Like he, yes. he, gave, he birthed a sports movement in a town where nothing won. Nothing grew. What he and Dwayne Wade and those guys built is the only thing worth it in this town for 20 years in sports. The Dolphins gave us one season. The Panthers have been bad forever. And today, people are tuning in nationally because we're an obnoxious heat show about to watch Boston and New York play for the top of the conference. And what happened at the arena last night, if you're watching the end of an era, there's something heartbreaking in it. But at the very same time, the Florida Panthers, who Greg Cody's ready to make an announcement about. Are you guys ready? Because wow. he, he, Greg Cody came in here, and yes, he's Homer, man. But <laughs> Greg Cody came in here. Are you ready to make this announcement, the only real big announcement we had today? I am. I'm ready. The Florida Panthers, for the first time in 30 franchise years, are going to raise the Stanley Cup. They're wow. going to win the championship. Wow, voice the cup. Listen, I it's a great season for the NHL. I can never remember as many 100-point teams. Great season, tough competition, I get all that. But the Kachuk trade turned a key. Uh, Paul Maurice is the one of the all-time great coaches. Why are you guys – hold on. Can I stop win? you for a second? Because Roy Greg? is rivaling Tony Kornheiser yeah. in I Got That Right uh -huh. at this point. Like, it d just dejected. I said that. Well, he yes. said it first. I, I mean, said that already. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, and I'm, I'm – in, in that case, I'm not announcing. I'm reiterating. Why, oh, thank you. Why – okay. Piggybacking. And, and, and one yeah. more thing. And, and Bill Zito does not get nearly enough credit. You're right. Okay. Dale Talon was an accomplished – NHL GM, when they got rid of Dale Talon and brought in this guy who, who spent his career as an agent, everybody's going, Bill Zito? He has been great. He's made great hires. I said all. We've the said all. He said all. Yeah. Yeah. He said, said all. Everyone has said everything. Everyone, First time I heard any of this, Greg. Everything yeah. you're saying. It's all been said. <laughs> it's all been said. Okay, yeah. you got to understand one thing. Me, Maximum. That's Until right. I say it, <laughs> it hasn't been said. Boom. Okay, understand that. <laughs> You're the mayor. Until I yeah. say it, it hasn't been said. <laughs> so, me, 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 I think I think it's an excellent lean in. You should lean in absolutely to I'm going to be self-involved, self-absorbed media member. That kind of thing! Maximum.
But the point, Stugatz, I'm saying, I know that we can be hardened media sports people post 50 years old. This is an old room covering sports in this town for a long time. And we haven't had, I don't think, a, a night that felt quite like last night when I pair what happens with the heat where you're like, ooh, okay, Boston got better. And this is their prime. And Jason Tatum's played in a lot of important games. And he's 25, 26. And they got hurt at the wrong time. And and maybe the Heat can recover and, and fix it this offseason. But it feels like these two teams have been fighting at the top for five years. And now one of the tires has blown off. And in the other corner of our city, the hockey team, the most championship-worthy thing we've had in hockey down here, and it's just really good and exciting. Take out that specific opponent that specific way. Six to one, get out of here. Your style of play dominated, but our style wins now. To beat that team that way, you could put it at the height of as good as Panther fans have ever felt about their team's chances. Have ever felt, yeah. Probably. Last night uh, felt like a changing of the guard in multiple respects, not just hockey in state, which it would appear, uh, and they're, they've got a ton of salary cap questions to answer, but it would appear that we are potentially at the end of this Tampa Bay run. What a glorious run. A run that built hockey in all of Florida. Tampa is a legitimate hockey town business. What a bar to set. And even in last year's Stanley Cup run, something was missing for the Florida Panthers. It was the ability to go through Tampa. Now, I don't think Tampa has the same opinion of Florida that Florida has of Tampa because Florida's always been chasing Tampa. But it felt like a changing of the guard in the state. And locally, it felt like a changing of the guard for your fan with, for your attention, for who is most championship ready. Now, I have actual legitimate confidence that the Miami Heat – We'll fix this this offseason because I don't think there's ever been a season in recent memory, very recent memory, where they've been told so definitively they are far away. That this isn't something that you can coach your way through, that there is a, a talent disparity in this conference in particular that needs to be addressed. I don't think that they've ever had the message sent to them so clearly. They will fix it. But back to Florida. It is absolutely their time. This is is the championship window. It may continue for a few years. That's the expectation. you got a lot of young talent locked up to long-term contracts, but you got Montour and you got Reinhardt, and you don't have enough money to pay both of them, it would seem right now. You locked it up for something. No, which, now's the time. Thank God, very, but now very, is the time. Very obviously, if you've got divided attentions, okay, and people are here for the heat tears today, and we will give them to you, except Jeremy has just popped up out of nowhere. I, he's not going to give you the heat hey, tears, I don't think. Why I would you here. Why are you here? Um, it's my it's my job, oh. but Ethan's here. Hmm. We're, we were doing just fine. Your your job was being done. I don't yeah. know why you had to come in you right now. Okay. Do you want to celebrate the Panthers? No, it's fine. I'll go. You want to celebrate getting Miami's fourth string quarterback? Hey, welcome, Jeremy. I would say this, Dan, <laughs> that whatever we got from Jimmy Butler over the last five years is a lot more than we all expected. Worth it. But we'll get back yes. to that in a second because yeah. we will. I I do. I'm going to stay here for a while today. So, guys, you know, the local hour is always my favorite hour, right. and. Uh, when seminal stuff happens in this town where you're part of the fabric of the story of the last 15 years told in sports. So God, what's happening with this Panther team, okay? A couple of years ago, that Lightning team showed you that style? No. Get it out of here. We were excited about it. We were excited about a high-flying hockey team headed into the... But we didn't know about hockey back then. What, we didn't understand that you've got, to, now? you've got to play like this. Well, don't play like that. Play like this. That's what we know. We don't know much else. We know. Don't play. Look, Tampa played like that, and we play like this. Don't play like that. That loses to this. Okay, now we're this. You know, we also know something That's else. Hockey. Now we're this, and you're that. Nice we also breakdown. know something else. A couple years ago, Bob Bad. Now... Better. That's good. Bob, Bob better. Barkov, good. Bad. Good Bob. Barkov line yeah. now good. Yeah. Barkov line was bad. Barkov bad. Defense was bad. Now 
good. Yeah, Barkov. Good Barkov. While the point production wasn't there for a little bit, the defensive performances certainly were. And you can't you can't talk about this series without acknowledging first and foremost. I think what is it? Five players in NHL history have had hundred assist seasons like Nikita Kucherov just had, and. He was very frustrating if he were a Tampa Quiet. Bay. I don't know what it's like to watch Tampa hockey and have it be that quiet. He was largely erased, especially on the, 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 the special teams unit that he does the most damage, is a power, uh, power play maven. He was promptly erased by guys like Barkov, Stenlin when he was in PK2, Forsling was just torturing him all series long, and he showed you that he's a bit of a, a specialty player. There's a lot of things that he can do, but what he does best can be erased when the intensity goes up to a certain level. And as we said yesterday, it's quantifiable. Totals go down, hits go up, block shots go up in the playoffs. You're playing a different game. The Panthers had to find that out because of Tampa. And I am so happy that this story has Florida doing that to Tampa because it was really missing from the last last run that they had last summer my favorite part of last night and Roy I want to know if you got in on this in the press box was late in the game I think we were up like five six one na 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 you cannot get into that in the press box I did not do that did you hum along with it no a little hum no a little toe tap it was so loud like it was the loudest I'd ever heard that song it was it felt so good that was the moment it just felt like we were finally having our moment with the lightning the barn the the barn was just top notch oh, yeah. Yeah. last yeah. night, and where in previous uh, previous playoff matchups between these two teams, you saw some blue sweaters and a, a fairly good amount of road representation. Not at all the case oh. in this series, unless it shifted over to Tampa, where you saw a lot more red jerseys oh. than you have in previous series. I know, I've been there. Nah, the, nah, nah. the state has changed. I love uh, nah, nah. journalist Chris Cody imagining that. In the press box. Oh, Roy's Roy Bellamy is oh, doing that chant. He was tapping along. He was. Come on, Roy. No, I had a smile on my face when it happened. Dorky but I was and not Be- tapping. Wow. Dorky and Bellamy. That's essentially were a breakdance routine. Right. Come on, Dorky. Was Dorky singing? Uh, no, he wasn't there. Uh, it's spring break with his kids. What? Uh, so he's back at Casa Jesus. Yeah. Casa Dwar is a dork. Jeez. <laughs> we were thinking of new names for that show. Yeah. Dork Belly. Oh, I love that. Belly Boys. <laughs> dork Belly. <laughs> dork Belly. Uh, belly well, and, we belly found, and Dorky. We found out that Roy in the hockey world is known as Belly, and everyone calls him Belly. That's a hockey thing, yeah. One person called me Belly, and that's what you got from that? Yes. <laughs> no falsehoods. You had, you had an interview last week on Puck Boys where the, the guest was calling you Belly the entire interview. In the video we saw from Tampa, Dworky was calling you Belly. Belly Laughs is a good, it's a good podcast oh, wow. name. Belly <laughs> Laughs. You guys really want me to change the name? Of this? Well, we're having, tr- <laughs> it's a, a struggling, name, I'm going right? to say. We want hockey, Roy. I'm going to hockey show. I'm going to say it's a struggling hockey show. It's Whoa. struggling? Wow. Yeah. It already it's got struggling. a spinoff. Yeah. Does it mean it can't soar to great heavens? Yeah, because should travels. that be the title? I, I don't yeah. necessarily think Tampa Bay Lightning <laughs> trivia was a step in the right direction. Yes, it was. That was that is that was the beginning of a soaring ascent into whatever you know belly with, door, with taxi or, or door the belly. Yes, exactly. what, whatever it is that it becomes. But the Bullen Wall was a good tidbit. When you was... asked the name of the Panthers goalie when they made the finals in 1996, and you said he's named after a bug, what bug were you thinking uh. of? <laughs> A hornet. What bug do you think I was thinking of? A bee. It's a bee. Yeah, Beezer. Beesbrook. Yeah. How is a Beezer? He's called a Beezer. Yeah. Famously had a bee on the back of his mask. Yes. See, some of us have been watching it? hockey. We're uh, in Roy, original seven Roy, market. Do you not get your own joke? Who do we want next? Is what I want to know. Carolina or Boston? As sarcasm. Well, you, you, it's either Toronto or Boston. Yeah. Close, yeah. close, Billy. Right. Yeah. No, I'm watching here. I yeah. appreciate you guys celebrating today. You do have Boston and the Rangers yeah. coming up. Like, I wasn't sure if there was a reseeding or what. I think it's going to be... I think it's going to be the Canes that come out of that uh, that matchup with the Rangers, but sure, but they're all great teams in the East, right? Okay, but the Rangers, uh, Stugatz, they're I don't good. know whether I'm going to. Yeah, well, no, they're the they're the best, right? The right, they won the Biden's Cup. Yeah, yeah. yeah. President's yeah. Trophy. President's Trophy. Yeah. But that's cursed. Right. The Biden Cup's yeah. cursed. Everybody knows. Yeah. That. Uh, cursed. But G- Greg Cody was laughing at his son. I will tell you, Chris, that absorbing this on behalf of the audience, while understanding exactly the emotion of being near the Sawgrass Mall singing na 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 at the Tampa Bay Lightning I can totally see how Cody's kid his heart soars loving sports and it feels like an emotional moment because you're knocking out that team it means something they're worthy champions like that that team is terrifying and that organization has made fl- taught taught 
Florida Panthers, what they had to do in hockey, and then they trade for Kachuk and everything changes. And now Kachuk is looking at Barkov and saying, I, he's been amazing. He wins all the face-offs. It's all the hits, all the blocks. Like, Barkov is out there not – look. I don't think there's been a hockey player who's disappointed Mike more than Barkoff over the last few years. In the, you in you the hate pre- him well, in the playoffs. Well, no, Bob, Bob, Bob and, and Barky during the, the runs that didn't end with the Stanley Cup Finals appearance that ended at the, at the feet of the Tampa Bay Lightning, they would go missing. They were inconsistent. Barky, he's, he's a tricky player to even talk about because he does a lot of things that – you really need to know hockey to, to realize what he does. So I'm really happy that he had that type of performance, a game-winning shorthanded goal, and then the second goal to bag a brace to really show people why exactly he wears a captain's seat because he's a, he's a bit of a different type of leader. It was offensively you were disappointed in yeah, the series yeah, prior. Yeah, in the series prior. like he, Defensively, he would always do it, even though Barkoff we had a much better been, game plan Barkoff this time. has been complained about more during the postseason here the last three years than any other Panther I can think well, of. Ekblad, Ekblad was Ekblad, up there. Yeah, he, well, he was hurt. He's been hurt. Ekblad is always going to be hurt, and that's part of the evaluation that you do right now. But Barky, now that Patrice Bergeron has moved on, Barky is the best two-way center in that sport. You can make a, a solid argument for, and he, I don't know what the award is called. Selkie Trophy. Uh, yeah, the Selkie Trophy. Yeah. That, But he should perennially be named a finalist, by the way. Bobrovsky, uh, a finalist yesterday, was named for the Vezina. He, w- he started a little slow. But then he got stronger as the game went on, and I think it's hugely imperative for their playoff for their playoff and championship chances that they get this rest now, not just for Sam Bennett, but also it seemed as though Bobrovsky, especially in that game four, was showing you you could use a bit of a breather. Greg, why were you laughing at your son's emotion? Because I can see Chris Cody finding that to be a swelling moment. And, and I can think the audience is listening to that and being like, hey, kiddo, first round. But like, I'm saying, but well, it's this too. team. It was the mo- I just did it, was, it to him. It really was the crowd sensing the moment of, like, we finally have our moment with this team right. to send them home, and we have the upper hand. And Roy's been in this longer than all of us, so I, I actually thought that he would be moved there. So maybe you don't sing along, but you are yeah. enjoying that moment. I think every year outside of one, Roy's always been about all the smoke when it came to mm-hmm. Tampa because, you know, for us to get to where we need to go, it needed to go through yes. Tampa for it to feel right. And we have that missing Thanos ring now. Yeah, absolutely. And now I'm already on the Bruins or Maple Leafs for the next round. Now we got to prepare for this one. Am, hey. I, am I the only person who heard that chant as a little bit disrespectful? Hold on a second, Greg. I don't understand. Kind of Roy's on the Cincinnati. Roy, Roy, Roy I really don't understand. Well, Roy, your fandom is one of the strangest Getting things ready? I've ever seen. You give press conference at the end, I'm, I'm on to Toronto. I'm on to Boston. As if you have to focus like a coach on the next game plan. Can't get too high. Can't get too low. Like, what are you doing? Dan. This was the first round. Yeah. We got a lot of hockey okay. left. Act like you've been there before. I, went, I already exactly said that. Right. Yeah. I would like to uh, to shout out, and if you go to the, the Levitard AF shop, you know that uh, the group chat had a good feeling about this. Because yeah. We, I tried to tell you. We have won Billy. World Rar 3, mm-hmm. but uh, that was just a key battle. These are good shirts. These the, are, like, I've, I, I am sure that this will be over the arena because people, these are shirts for this time in, in, this time in South Florida and this marshland near Sauger. Uh, we can sell this shirt there. We continue to build on our original seven tradition, and World War Three is a huge piece of that. We told you exactly how this series was going to go. You stay out of the, the penalty box largely, and Game 4 was un disastre uh-huh. uh, of epic proportions. But if you stay out of that uh, penalty box largely, you're you better know, than they are. You know that you're better 5v5, and I think you can say that for the next round as well. I think uh, there is a talent disparity between uh, – Florida and Boston. Toronto's got a lot of talent, but there's a lot of stuff going on there, and I don't think they're going to make it through that series. The funny thing about last night was it was actually Tampa that was better five on five. They had the most opportunities, they had the most shot attempts. It, but the Panthers special teams really carried that. The one. loudest cheers in the arena last night were the two goals taken off. It was amazing. Yeah. The yeah. second one, the first one was clear. It was coming off. Everyone kind of knew. The second one, the arena was 50-50. The Duclair one, that one was yeah, close. Yeah, if the, if the Sorelli goal is called a goal, maybe they don't change it. But 
they it did go to replay and they they said emphatically the call was confirmed the ref was pretty quickly there you cannot like the rule i'm not crazy about the rule i think you have to touch the goalie to interfere florida's had some goals pulled off the board where there's somebody in the crease and they're not actually affecting the goalie but it's still called interference letter of the law you're in that crease of your own volition and not pushed into it that's goalie interference well here's the thing that tampa's big adjustment in this series was net front presence and that's what happened it went against them in that situation you can't yeah. be inside Housery from Duke. Anytime. Yeah. Little Housery from Duke. But John Cooper, after the game, is uh, is whimpering his way into the offseason, saying you can't disallow those goals, that uh, everybody should be wearing skirts. The goalkeepers should be wearing Classic skirts. Classic Coop. Uh, it was a bad challenge out of him. The fact that he challenged it, it was a move of desperation, knowing that this is, is the only penalty? thing that I had left. I, I get where he's coming from on the second on the second goal, and I, I understand why he challenged that. But That was a big risk. You got – he you, was desperate, though. You lost a game six one. You lost a series five one. Pretty lame, Billy. That's pretty lame. Good analysis. Cheaters never prospered. That's right, uh, <laughs> Billy. What was your take? Because here we are in the middle of this. The Marlins get swept by the Nationals. Yeah. It's raining. Keeping an eye on that one. It's rain. It was raining. Still early. It's, it's still early. Yeah. Well, it wasn't too early last night. They have a dome for weather, but it was raining at Lone Depot Park. Yeah. And and your baseball season is over. They're the worst team in baseball. Swept at home by the Nationals. Uh, blown out in every game. <laughs> Yesterday was just 101-62, Dan, you know. Yep. Uh, On pace to finish 30 and 132. But, but yeah. who's counting? But the, the the because I've got the perspective here of Greg Cody's in the middle of this. Is, you remember what this was for him last year, going to the finals with two unprecedented runs at eight, as eight, the eight seeds at the same time. Not going to happen this year. No, it's not. Right. Where are you with what last night was between the two sports in terms of being a historic Miami night? The, the Heat uh, might as well not even take the flight. I'm to, telling to, you. To Boston. They really? should save the money and, and give their travel expenses to charity. Yeah. Well, seriously. I, I have that, I mean, I have no that series go. coming back here. Yeah, I'm I not did. doubting Coach Spo. Hmm. You guys can doubt him. Yep. Your own peril. Go ahead. I have full I faith in this Are you kidding me? I mean, come on. I feel so bad for Spolstra. He's giving serious minutes to Patty Mills. Look. He's desperate. My opinion, He's got paid. My opinions on the Heat have been really on the macro level. If you listen back to the parade of gas bags, my opinions aged the most gracefully. I was in a, the one out there doubting them game by game, saying that this is going to be a sweep. They're not going to get a game. He's the best coach in the NBA, folks. Learn some respect. Patty yeah. Mills is on the heat? <laughs> Should give him some minutes to Cole Swider. <laughs> He tried was to loose. tell him. He was, he loose. was looking did, loose yesterday you tried, morning. You did yeah. try to tell him. You did have the good coaching analysis. You tried to give him Looked a Looked in move. his eyes, and I said, not, that's a loose man right not, there. Not more Kevin Love minutes. Uh, the, I'm not, I'll analyze the Heat stuff in a second. Their offense is very limited, okay? At, uh, if you have the entirety of a series <laughs> to, to – uh, I mean, these games in the 80s, I don't even recognize yeah. games in the 80s in the sport right. anymore. And, and they are particularly ill-suited for referees allowing people to play a little longer so they can't have their free throw advantage. Heat fandom is largely a poison, and I, and I submit uh, as evidence – the victory lap, I guess you could call it that, that people were calling uh, what had happened in Phoenix and taking a screenshot of, of their bench and saying some Heat fans wanted this. Yeah, yeah, I think it plays out differently with Spo than Bogle and with Miami's front office and leadership than it does with Phoenix's. Are you seriously fe- flexing when you're scoring 80 points, bro? Like, well, but you're going you're going back and forth off of being uh, being right about this Heat team or not, and I will analyze you know what comes next for the Heat in uh, in the next segment because I I do think well it's uh, Game Five right uh, yeah. yes better get to it today yes we better get to it Jeremy has now returned to the room oh, I, I I'm sure he is hopeful and uh, and still waving the Heat flag I'm guessing I mean it's going to be really tough. Uh, their offense yeah. can't do anything. They're they're undermanned. Um, and when you're instead of playing Terry Rozier, Duncan Robinson, Jimmy Butler, you're getting minutes from Patty Mills, uh, Delon Wright, who's been as productive as you can expect him to be. Your offense is going to completely fall apart, and that's what it's done. What's crazy is that the Heat have outscored the Celtics when Bam Adebayo is on the floor. It's just the minutes where he's not there, they've been outscored by 40. And it's just a disaster in that regard. It's the same in Philadelphia's series. Embiid leaves the court and the plus-minus numbers are crazy. Like, he can't leave the court. Uh, but I do think one of the things that happens with injury when you steam through these things, Stugatz, I mean, 
The Duncan Robinson was a really useful player for them all year when they looked to be good at offense, and physically he's not right. Rozier's not right. They traded for him because Hero wasn't right. Jimmy Butler's not right. All of that stuff is a bunch of injury hoo-ha, but it wasn't but, a, you know, two months ago that I would have said the Heat at their healthiest best had a chance against Boston in this series. Uh, this team does not have a chance against Boston in this series. There's no coming back three games. There's no – I don't think they're going to win in Boston either. But the offense cannot do anything if you have an – like I said at the beginning of the series, Boston's better at defense and Miami's at offense, and Miami is better at uh, – and Miami's better at nothing. Miami's better at nothing. They made 23 threes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. The shame of it is their defense has been good enough uh, to hold Boston to about 100 points. But they're scoring 80, and that's never going to cut it. Greg? This is the new and unimproved Dan Levatar show with the Stugats. Gamble on by DraftKings. There he is, one of the all-time favorites in the history of our show, Ron McGill. Look at him. He is. He's one of the all-time favorites. I would say he's the favorite. I don't know. I mean, he's got the highest Q rating I know of. No one doesn't like uh, Ron McGill. Excuse the double negative. He did a book with Greg Cody. Uh, he got Greg Cody to work hard. That is <laughs> hard to do at this stage in his career. But he made Greg Cody care about an animal as well. I wrote a book. Without working. A what? You wrote a what? A book. Sorry. I don't know okay. what happened there. Stugatsbook.com. <laughs> Let's yeah. have that as the promotion, please. Let's have that be the commercial <laughs> for I wrote a book. Or <laughs> I wrote a bic. Order today, and you get an autographed copy of my bic. You okay. wrote a razor. There's no selling out around here. Uh, we uh, we try to keep it about the art. And the book that they did together, I, I will tell people, because we're selling books around here today. Yeah. Uh, Greg, you, when I say that, when I make the joke... I don't know that you've made a lot of adult friends late in life because you respect them so much uh, that you would take the time to work very hard for a year to craft a book about his story. That I mean, I feel like you and Ron became friends in there, and I don't know you to make friends late in life. Right. Uh, I, I wouldn't have done the book, and I was thrilled to be asked. I wouldn't have done the book if, if Ron wasn't such a... Uh, uh, a, a generous person, uh, great at what he does, a champion of animals uh, and wildlife, uh, an institution in South Florida. Everything about Ron made me want to work with him. And also, it was something I'd never done before. I'd never not written sports. And so for the year or so that we collaborated on this book, it was a, a, a joyful side road for me to take. I love everything about it. I'm thrilled the way the book came out, and I'm glad it's doing well. But are you friends? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yes, we are. I think we were friends before then, weren't we? I, I, well, we go way back, but I think we were casual friends. You know, I think we yeah. were like friendly, Agreed. friendly acquaintances and everything. Uh, I never but, had you over my house for bacon. That's true. And boy, that bacon was so good. It's good so bacon. Good. Oh, oh my God, God, it's good bacon. <laughs> we oh. ate it a couple yeah, of days later, bacon. believe it or not, oh. and it was just fantastic. Oh, yeah, Best good. bacon I've ever had. That's right. Mm. Greg's wife has never shut up about it. Best I don't, bacon I've ever. Had. I don't intend to throw a wrench in this friendship. You know me; I'm not one to do so, but. I was looking on the social medias the other day, and I saw Ron promoting that he was going to be at an art museum, and he was going to be telling the story of Quasi. And I said, you know what? I think that's Greg's story and Ron's story together. And now it seems like Ron's going on tour telling Quasi's story sans Greg, and it rubbed me a little bit the mm. wrong way. kind of felt well, like a well, band no, wait a minute. Wait, was wait, going wait, out wait, there wait, and Billy. just Billy. one singer Billy. singing the Let it finish, Ron. Billy. Ron. Let it finish. Billy. Okay. Billy. Billy. Yes, sir. Listen. Uh, the Panthers are in the playoff. The Heat's are in the mm -hmm. playoff. It's not like Greg doesn't have a ton of stuff on his plate. Perfect so I'm to trying strike. to pick up the slack promoting the book uh, because both of us benefit when I promote the book. Yes. And I think he's just too busy. Plus, he looks like a freaking truck hit him. I don't want to put him in front of a bunch Thank of kids you. looking like that. It's going to scare him. It would. Hmm. Uh, you know what? Ron promoting the book without me rubs me in the right way, <laughs> baby. And let me tell you why. I did no, two. No. Yeah, I, I, I did two. I did, I, I, I did two means. combined book promotions with Ron. One was at his zoo, and one was at Books and Books. They both attracted sellout crowds. They were wonderful events, and now I am thrilled <laughs> that he is still promoting the book on the ground, on the ground floor, uh, without me, because as he says, I have a lot on my plate uh, with work. Uh, plus, I have 
almost no interest in uh, you know speaking to a, a 35 women at a, at a book club. Sorry. You got to sell books. Man. I know. What I mean, you, unless they're all buying the Pride of the Lion. What do you mean? You're, hey, you're, just, sold, just sold 100 more. Just sold wait, 100 what more. What did you just you. do? Wait, you have... <laughs> yeah, what edit, kind, that, edit that out, what I just what said. What kind of authoring <laughs> promotion is that to say I wouldn't, I wouldn't go ever to be with 35 women at a book club who are there to buy my book? I mean, because Ron loves that enough for both of us. He's built yeah. to do and that. It was, it was actually about 60 women, and it was great. They there all bought go. books. It was great. Perfect. Let's be honest. Who do you want showing up to that event, Ron or Greg? Exactly. No, but when, <laughs> I don't understand. It's not about who do I want showing up to that event. How are you actively against the people who are giving you money to buy a book and don't want to be around them? I am actively for people who buy this book. They're some of my favorite people. <laughs> you just don't want to meet them. Okay, you just don't want to be in their presence. They're book lovers, and I love them. Believe me. <laughs> but you wouldn't want to go to something like this. Yeah, not particularly. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> you know. But that, this is how a book I, gets promoted. Books aren't doing great, you know, Greg? Yeah, books, this one is. Books, no, but I'm just saying in general, reading right. Reading is not something that people are putting in their hands anymore. Wait, well, what? It's true. I mean, nowadays people listen to a book and they call it reading. Bulletin. Right. If you listen to a book on not an reading. audio thing, you, you haven't read a book. Mm -hmm. wow. I've read plenty of books. I'm sorry. <laughs> but if your you, book's going to be on audio, isn't if you, it? If you listen to a book, you haven't read a book. Okay. I mean that literally. If you've read Heat 2 and I've listened to Heat 2, we both know the same amount about Heat 2. Okay. If, if this is how you listen to a book, if this is how you read a book in your earbuds, you're consuming a book, but you're not reading a book. Reading is a tactile experience. You have the book in your hand. Okay. You're uh -huh. actually Fine. physically turning Semantics pages. Semantics game. Okay. But I've consumed that book just as well as you've you, consumed it. You have consumed it, but not as well. Mm. What do you mean? You've you've taken the secondhand road. Yeah. <laughs> you've taken the easy way. Who are out. you to tell me reading retention is better than audio you retention? Know who's I'm reading an audio that, file. You know who's reading that book? The Who? person speaking to you is reading that book. That's yeah. True. And then they did a bang up job. Okay. You should hear I mean, the De Niro and Pacino impressions. Okay, I, it's the same guy. Okay, really? You know what? People people tell agree him. with me. Mm. Wait, what do you mean people book, agree with if you? If you don't He's if right. you're hearing a book, you're not reading a book. I'm not degrading people who do the audiobook thing. No. I'm just telling you it you, is yes, not you most certainly are. It is not a book reading experience. Greg, you're going to do it. The audio version of a book. I mean, I don't know Ron, is this even out on an audiobook? I have no if idea. If you and him did it and he wait a minute. Wait I would minute. read the wait a minute. So wait, oh, so wait. So wait. So I can't believe you guys haven't already thought of this. Ron not has to do this. Wildly unsurprising. Yeah. Quasi. Uh, what, what Mike Ryan is, if you guys were to do it that way, with Billy popping out of the shadows well, saying on, Quasi's name this. that way. Yeah. If you guys, Dan's got a lot of ideas for book companies. He really yeah. What I would say, if, if, if Ron and Greg poured into the evolution of book promotion an audio version of this book, with the sound effects that Ron makes, you just said that you're having a better experience than reading because you get the Pacino impersonator. It's not even, and he's saying, Did no. you know that Pacino says that it's not well known, but that character that he played in Heat was a coke addict? <laughs> they just wanted to be very subtle with it. it was, okay, that's and why his he, performance was pretty that's subtle, why he if you recall it correctly. It. Yeah, okay, understood. But they never had him using cocaine. The, the point is, Greg, you're actively not promoting your book. You're being against your customers. No. Oh, oh, he God, is promoting it. Every time I see him, he's got the book right in front of him. That's Thank more than you. I can say. Thank you. I'm promoting it right now. Exactly. It's a life-size book. It's not a giant uh, placard yeah. like that. It's also it flashy. <laughs> when I read a book, all up in here. I don't need to be showing people is that, that right? I read when you, By the way, when you read a movie script, you haven't seen that movie. I've seen it in my head. Wow. Okay. I've All read right. plenty well, of scripts. That's, that's, that's a great analogy, Greg. i got to go with Greg on that one. Thank you, Ron. There's yeah. just something to it, Greg, where you touch the pages, you feel the ink on your fingers. Tactile. Oh, tactile. Tactile sensation. That's right. It, it, the book even has a smell. It has a smell. Ooh, oh. Do I smell quasi? Take a whiff. Oh, take a whiff of that. Mm, <laughs> it's like perfume. Oh, Look at this quasi. beautiful lion. Look at this beautiful <laughs> lion. I'm a, I'm a bit disturbed. That at this stage in our career, the Ron McGill segment uh, has become, I wrote a Bic uh, selling <laughs> Stugatz's book, and it's become, it rubs me the right way, baby, as baby. we just completely baby. sell out uh, asking the listeners to read. Tactile. I mean, pick or up listen. a listen. When I say pick up a book, I mean it literally.
Don't pick up an earbud. Well, uh, Greg, if your book was an audio book, would you be all in favor of people listening to it your would book? Be, it would be wonderful. Okay. But I would still prefer they actually read the book itself. Mm-hmm. But you're understanding that more people would buy it if you and Ron were doing the reading, correct? Yeah, you're, that's and, a problem. You're un- but are you not understanding the evolution of the medium that would make reading a different thing for a different generation? I have spoken to the Miami Herald about that. Um, you can click on a, a, a certain thing on my column and have somebody dictate my wow. column to you. But it's a it's like an electronic it's probably AI. It's an electronic voice. It's not me. I have volunteered to put my columns in my own voice and and they never followed up on it. Hmm. Okay, but newspapers aren't exactly thriving. An audio I, newspaper I didn't say though, they Dan, were. that would be it. That's an idea. Game changer. But yeah. it's it's a way to increase traffic and, and it's called the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with Greg. You Thank can go you. to the Herald. Times does every- one. Pablo Torre did one for a while. Now he's doing one with us. <laughs> now, but every story in the Herald that goes, if you don't have time to read, mm-hmm. click here to listen, and it sounds like a robot. It Thank takes you. away totally the effect of the yeah. of the article. A hundred percent. That's and, and and I grant you it's a small example, but it's a way to maybe get a few extra readers. No, newspapers have failed to evolve. Right, that is correct. It's one of the reasons that they're failing, and correct. they were taken out so easily. That's one of the things that's appalling about everything that has happened to the American information <laughs> system. Mm-hmm. Books are not thriving either. But one way to get them to thrive is to meet with fifty people at a book club. And thank God Ron's doing it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and to promote the idea that this should be read in whatever way you choose to con- con- consume the information. Right. I can't believe that you're shaming Preferably. me. Uh, I'm a I'm target reader. demo right here, and you're just telling me I'm not good enough no. to consume your book. Look, I'm happy. I help your bottom line. I'm happy that you're consuming books. What I'm saying is I think you're cheating yourself out of the experience. Never had LASIK surgery. It's you don't tactile. know what reading does to my eyes. He These has are, a preference. That's all a he's saying. conscious decision that I'm making. He would okay. like you to read the book, not listen to it. That's fine. But don't, he's okay with you listening to it. Don't no, be, he doesn't seem okay with well, it. Well, I think I mean, he's okay uh, when he gets money. He's, he's very might, highfalutin. No, you're he's saying he's, you're, he's fine with <laughs> you consuming it. You're just not reading it is what he's saying. Yeah, tactile. Like if you listen to a book, just don't say, yeah, I read that book. No, I read it. You didn't. I can, and I will. Okay. You can't smell an audio book. Thank you. I wrote a book. Thank you, Billy. <laughs> it's going to make <laughs> me laugh every time. I wrote a book. It's the perfect <laughs> That's the perfect way to promote it. We have to create a commercial around this. This is what has to stop the advertising train of Stugans right here. I wrote a there it is. Just I wrote a book. Build it all read. around that. Fast <laughs> There's nothing in there. I wrote a book. He's just taking money from the audience. Hypothetically, if I were swallowed by a large anaconda, and I understand that it breaks the bones and whatnot, but if you've seen the late 90s film Anaconda, John Voight gets regurgitated and he even winks at Jennifer Lopez. Is that humanly possible to remain consciousness after partially going through the digestive tract of an anaconda? Uh, it is It is. Possible, not probable, assuming wow. that the head is still out and you're able to breathe. Um, you can certainly get some very bad enzyme burns into the legs and such. But uh, yeah, as long as you're able to breathe, which I don't think is going to be the case because an anaconda is not going to start swallowing you until you stop breathing, until it's choked the life out of you. They don't crush your bones or anything. They just, you know, they, they, they constrict around the vascular system and they don't allow you to breathe. So it's not going to start swallowing you until you're dead. The Key West crocodile, saltwater crocodile, featured in Roadhouse, uh, killing a man. Uh, Mike Ryan told me I was a fool for thinking that that was a ridiculous scenario. Am I a fool for thinking that a ridiculous scenario? I didn't see the scene, but there's nothing being foolish about the the ability of of a large crocodile to kill a human. It's been done, you know, unfortunately, many, many times. It's not something that people need to panic about. Every time you see a crocodile, the crocodile's out to kill me. That's not the case. But the crocodile certainly has the capability to do so. You should be weary, though, in any marina that has saltwater crocs, because oftentimes saltwater crocs are hanging out in that marina because people are throwing fish into the into the water after they take back their hulls for the day. So if anything goes in the water, especially a henchman, that saltwater croc is going to pounce. Well, yeah, and, and you don't have to say saltwater croc. Crocodiles here in Florida are not true. They're, they're, they're crocodiles that can be found in salt water, but the true saltwater crocodile is only found in Australia. That is a man killer. They can get to be over 18 feet. That's a very different crocodile than the one we have here, even though the crocodile we have here, the American crocodile, can be found in salt water. 
Let me show you something here, video of a zebra. Tell me what we're watching here, Ron. Zebras, uh, what are they doing? Um, they're standing in the middle of the street. This is probably in a place, uh, I don't know, maybe South Africa or such. Washington. That, um, no, North Bend. Washington. That's Washington. North Bend, Washington yeah. State. Oh, it's then they got out of, they got out of a, they got out of a. You, you don't know, think they're those... indigenous? No, they're not <laughs> indigenous. So they're, they're invasive. not invasive. Um, you know, I said what I said first, because I have seen this in Africa with, where zebras will cross roads in different areas. They have, you know, they, they transition to different areas and sometimes it's too have a bit, you know, habitated places, but uh, no, these are obviously zebras that were somebody's little herd that they had in one of their sanctuaries or one of their little, you know, wild exotic animal resorts. What is the danger of something like that to either the zebras or us? The danger is to the zebra that's going to get hit by somebody. Uh, zebra's going to run away from you. If you try to corner one, it can kick you. They can bite you. They can be really, but they're not going to come after you for no reason, unless it's a, you know, a, a mare protecting her foal. Uh, zebras are not you know, it's like coming across horses. They're going to run away from you if you give them a way out. If you don't give them a way out and you corner them, they can be very, very dangerous. Ron, it seems like there's more and more scenes like that where you see animals on streets, animals that have gotten loose from somewhere. I'm curious, in, in the history of Zoo Miami, right through. Uh, what have been examples of an animal getting loose and all of a sudden wandering among people in the zoo? And has that ever been a perilous situation? We, we've never had an animal kind of wandering amongst the people in the zoo. We have had some hoofstock, you know, antelope, deer that have jumped out of an exhibit uh, that, uh, you know, something startled them, whether it be a loud clap of thunder or something like that. And as soon as they jumped out of the exhibit, they realized, oh, my gosh, I'm in a place that I'm not familiar with. They jump right back in. Um, so that, that, that's something that has happened, but uh, it's never presented a danger to the public. Ron, thank you, sir. If anyone wants to support the things that Ron is doing, it's money that goes straight to conservation and, of course, his Cadillacs and his uh, upgraded wardrobe. <laughs> uh, but he's the one handling everything. There's no bureaucracy, and you'll just help people, like, if you want to care about jaguars. And you could do so by buying the pride of a lion by Greg Cody <laughs> and Ron McGill. Thank you, Ron. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Take care. Thank you. Greg, we cut you off. You had some Miami Heat thoughts for us, and I want to get back to this. But I just before I do so, uh, it's being reported now that Joel Embiid has missed shoot around this morning with a migraine. His status for tonight's game remains questionable. Uh, my instinct on Joel Embiid is to feel bad for him. I can also go the other route and say, you know what? He's under it. Doesn't really need to go to shoot around this morning. Stay at the hotel. Don't even go out in the street. It's okay, Joel. Everything's hurting right now. Just go home and be at the game. Just be there for tip-off? I Just, yeah, yes. Well, right. I, I don't know that I would say migraine. If it is indeed a migraine, I would feel very bad that the pressure that this person is under <laughs> is making his face fall apart. Like, he's already played a playoffs wearing a mask. He's under a great deal of duress. I know these guys are muscles on top of muscles, and we expect them to endure everything. But he's a human being. And he's been saying with Jokic for two years, I'm the MVP. I, here it is. Here's his, like his career has a chance to blossom or he will be left behind because Anthony Edwards is here now and Jason Tatum is here now and the league is going to be fought over the next few years. And this is what ha Philadelphia has wrought for 15 years of losing and embarrassment. What he'll have to do, which I think he's trying to avoid, is just join other superstars and try to create a super team elsewhere or in Philadelphia. That's what he's Correct. trying to not and, do. And but. I would not blame him or say it's cowardice if he does so. This is the weight these people are under. We are making fun of Kevin Durant. Stugatz, what just happened in Phoenix is pretty damn interesting, man. They mortgaged everything yep. for right now and they got caught between the league is being taken over by young people and this is the year that Durant and Steph and LeBron, we can all say, oh, you're not close. It's, t it's a new time. Like, maybe you can hang on somewhere, but not the way you're built, not where you live now. The league's been taken from you. It's it, it, A guy in Denver took it and he's got a whole bunch of people coming for him now who are uh, OKC, Stugatz, that starting lineup in OKC. 99.5% of its points are being scored by people under 25 years old. Right. That's never happened. This young team, like Shea Gilgis Alexander, people are about to learn, oh, he's Anthony Edwards adjacent, and they're coming for the ogre. Like, they want, they want Jokic, and everybody wants Jokic, but you're about to see where history gets made, stories get told, and everyone is impressed by Anthony Edwards and, and, and 
God almighty, what a cool moment for Anthony Edwards to have his favorite player say that Anthony Edwards is his favorite player. That's awesome. What, what yeah. a torch for Kevin Durant to give to Anthony Edwards that he is considered Kevin Durant's favorite player, and Kevin Durant loses to him in a sweep. Get out of here. You're the first team out. And he says, your league, kid, you're my favorite player. I can't believe we're living in a world where I'm excited for Nuggets and T-Wolves. I mean, what a great it's series a, it's a that's going to be. It's a great series. Amazing. And you will hear now all of this that falls on Embiid. Carl Anthony Towns is going to get it for the first time. Anthony Davis has lived under it for a while. It's unpleasant. Like, I know we think these guys are giants. But it sucks, man. Thursday night, Charles Barkley, you're Anthony Davis. You're 30 and 15. He's saying, more street clothes. More. That's who you are. Yeah, I know you're great. More. We're Hall of Famers. Me and Shaq. Are you going to be one? Like, one of the things I find fascinating about what just happened last night, I can't he is. I can't talk. Yeah. Everyone gets in. Yeah, no, but definitively. Yeah, for sure. Emphatically is. Yes. One of the things that I just love about the storytelling of this time of year is that the demands on these people feel superhuman. I just told you I'd be scared to be Joel Embiid tonight. Man, New York's obnoxious, to gods. New York is great. New York, you want this fandom. It is so loud. I, it is... It, I, may I ask you, what is it specifically about Joel Embiid? Because you feel more sorry for him than anyone else in the national media landscape. And, and he's not is, alone, by that the is, way. I understand. Like, right. He's got uh, you know, slight facial paralysis that in some cases often uh, stresses the cause of it. Sometimes it's other things. But he can play out there. He's shown you that he can play it. I don't know why you're, you're feeling so bad for Joel Embiid. He's been pretty – he's had it pretty good over there. They've brought in superstar teammates for him. He's got to deliver. I he was he was delivering to near historic proportions before he got hurt this year. They, they're he supposed was an to, MVP waiting to happen yeah. again and, before and, he got hurt. And he's putting up fifty burgers. And he, like I understand, he's not the the two way force it used to be, but he's going up against like Jalen Brunson. Okay, but th so this is my point, and this is where I would tell you the stories to me are the most interesting because I believe. LeBron James getting knocked out of the playoffs last night, dominating all of the discourse for 20 years and making the league so much stronger than it was based on the strength of I'll be the next Jordan. The amount of pressure that we put on this human being for 20 years makes it so we're still arguing, is he the greatest, is he the greatest one? What he's done for 20 years should be celebrated and applauded. Like, wow, amazing, huge pressure all the time. And now it goes out the door and gets fought over the remains of it. What Kobe left, what Michael Everyone's left. Everyone's chasing that ghost. That's correct. But in the heat of how cruel LeBron James's age was, he's, the, he's not the first social media athlete, but this crew remembers when LeBron James joined Twitter, and this crew here remembers the voice that that carried as he took over the sport. That guy conquered it all, and I believe we were cruel to him on the ascent and felt entitled to it. Be better than Jordan. Be better than Jordan. It's a big ask for the Embiid's of the world. Some men will live right. up to it. Some will lose to Antetokounmpo well, or if, Jokic. Well, if you're just comparison shopping on, on pressure and stress on the body, Embiid, again, charmed existence compared to what we saw with LeBron. LeBron found a way. Now I know it is unfair to assume that Joel Embiid can be that kind of player. We're talking about top two all time with LeBron James. But he is an MVP. He is one of the greats, and he has never gotten out of the second round. Do it. You're going up against a team that is missing a max contract. This is not an overwhelming Knicks team. No, it's not. You're going up against Jalen Brunson. I mean, Dan, you're going up against Jalen Brunson. He's supposed to be a better superstar and, than Jalen Brunson. And to Mike's point, it's a great one. LeBron really went through it. Embiid hasn't been through anything yet. LeBron I went know, through I know, it for I, decades. And, and, and so, uh, agreed, Stugatz, by comparison, nothing. But I will just place in front of you the process, short-circuited mentally, not one but two first-round picks. Mm -hmm. Ben Simmons and Markel Fultz fell apart mentally. I'm just telling you, the pressure cooker can eat up human beings. And you can say, do more, do more, do more. And his body can hurt, and he can give you 50, and he doesn't get the rebounds in the fourth. I understand. I'm simply explaining to you, LeBron James conquered that pressure cooker, and you and Skip Bayless were chasing him the whole time. You're not as great as you think you are. You're not as great as you think you are. That falls on Joel Embiid tonight. And I'm just telling you, the guy that overcomes it, I applaud it. Bravery, Le LeBron man. took out the Pistons. 
Look at the team that he had. He, he conquered it with, like, Drew Gooden. Uh, you've had Harden. You've had Simmons when everyone rated him highly. You had Jimmy Butler. They gave Tobias Harris a big contract. You have Daryl Morey, who is reputed to be one of the best GMs there. You've had good coaches come in and out of there. You have a former champion head coach right now. Like, he's, he's got a at, a at at a certain point, you got to live up. Or this is – what happens on the other side of that coin? I, I root for the best stories. The best story tonight is Joel Embiid not healthy. Now he's got Bell's palsy walking into the viciousness that can be MSG it's and a great shutting story. up that crowd. It's a great story. The whole thing, this, this is what I love. This is what I love about playoff basketball. And Taylor's going to be there. Right. Oh, where is Taylor? Where is he on right a train. now? No, he's very He's going to meet up with us soon. He's, uh, fans have been buying him snacks all along the eastern <laughs> seaboard and running it out to trains. <laughs> Taylor is taking a 20, 28 hour train that will drop him off stinky, 28 hours stinky at MSG. That's what Embiid's walking into New York's ass crack today. It's been on a train for 28 hours. I wrote a book. It really is amazing advertising. You can't dispute <laughs> that you. it's amazing advertising. We have to figure out a way to continue to trump up how giant a book this is going to be because Stugatz really does have all these people working for him, and this is a big day, the day that we're announcing his book cover, even though we did it five or six days ago. Uh, because the book is going to come out. It's, uh, it is being published by Random House. It is. Stugatzbook.com. Today you get an autographed copy. How about that? And an insert. A special insert. Insert a book snake. The okay. random house or just like a random house? I made the that joke house. in the foreword. Yes. I was hoping <laughs> to say that you just cool. took it from me. It's okay. It's all right. No more Stugatz book jokes. I need them. <laughs> well, it looks like it's Porchlight that, that is publishing your book. Oh. Oh. If you order on Porchlight between now and Thursday, you get an autographed copy. Yes. Yeah. And an insert. Special insert. A book snake. Who's the publisher? <laughs> Do you know? Random house. Are you sure? I'm positive. That is a Random House logo on there. Uh, I think that's their logo. None of us were sure. Now, here's a a question a lot of people... Nervous for a second. question a lot of people are asking, Stugatz, is what if they pre-ordered the first time you asked them to pre-order? Now they're not getting an autographed book or they're not getting a bookmark? Because, like, people started pre-ordering in February when you asked them to. Talk to Random House. Oh, no. I said them that way. Because it it would seem as though... Take care of everyone. Don't worry about it. It would seem as though the longer you wait, the more desperate you guys will get and the more you will get. I will sign any book that is put in front of me. Okay, I don't care where Stugatz. you're from, when you bought it. Stugatz. I was it have to be your, your book, book or Stugatz, How do you roll this out in a way that makes the people who want it most get the least for their dollar? Mm-hmm. I'm just following Random House's lead here. I mean, they're telling me what to do and when to do it, and so here we are. Now they can't get a book snake. Oh, well, I'll get them one. Don't worry about it. Are you saying the people who ordered before today? You said pre-order before, you get this. Now you say pre-order now, you get more. I will bring this up to Random House on my next call, okay? It's, and it, it appears to be on sale today, too. You're actively stealing from the customers. How about that? You're making them buy. Like, the people who wanted the last ones are going to have to buy again. They're going to people. They're gonna have Feel these, free to buy another. They're going to be. $7 <laughs> off today. Yeah, buy Back a dozen. Now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Back right. now. It is a good time to have your own brand, as Stugatz has learned. Jason Kelsey parlayed his thing into an ESPN job. He could have had any job, and it appears that is that does this mean that RG three is out at ESPN? Uh, because I I've read reports, but they're going to have to shake things up in order to make room for Kelsey. And again, Stugatz, I will tell you, this is a fascinating thing to watch in the media age. When the athletes come for all of the great jobs and have their own brands, Jason Kelsey has turned himself into what's going to be the most powerful offensive lineman voice there's been since John Madden, like since since whatever it is, since wow. uh, since Art Donovan. Like you don't get to be famous as one of these offensive linemen. You know, Art Donovan did talk shows. Dan Deardorff, like you don't get to be famous. Unless you get a microphone and get more famous late in life. And this is what's going to happen for Jason Kelsey Kelsey being Taylor Swift adjacent. Great job for him. Great job for ESPN. He's going to be an obvious star. A beer belly everyman on your football. He's already a star. No, but I'm saying he... A whole bunch of people who aren't necessarily listening to Travis Kelsey and Jason Kelsey's podcast. Stugatz. 
Football is such a giant. No matter how big your podcast is, you sit on television and there are millions more who know your face and voice in a way they never did when you were a player. Not yeah. even Jason Kelsey. Not even in Philadelphia. Not even in Philadelphia where he is an icon. The football mask has always hidden these guys under stardom. Offensive linemen don't get this. And he could have had any job that he wanted in the media. Like, he could have literally made whatever move he wanted to in football. And I, I would love, if Amazon's going to make another documentary on them, I would love to see the business of what it's been to be the Kelseys the last few years. Because everything they've done to become non-quarterback voices for this sport. So, God, one of the fascinating things about all of the generational change around here is that football has survived Going from the guys you loved, Roethlisberger and Romo and Peyton Manning and Tom Brady. They're the league. They're the ones you know. Give them broadcasting jobs. Keep them in the media. Build the bridge to the future and celebrate Caleb Williams when he gets here because the whole league is changing and it's Lamar Jackson and we want to keep this thing. Basketball's got a different problem. Basketball's got foreigners at the top of the sport. A lot of foreigners at the very top of the sport. And a guy who can't jump. <laughs> He's a foreigner. Yeah. I wouldn't say foreigners being successful is a problem. Uh, I would say it is because you want American stardom for American fans in basketball so that you can make the league change from the stars that were palatable before to, hey, if you don't like Lamar Jackson over here, are you sure that Anthony Edwards is ready to be face of the league at 22? Because there's some John Morant stuff there. Not, not the trouble stuff, but the perception stuff that – doesn't allow a guy to be a face of a league because you want him to beat Steph Curry or Jason Tatum or someone that has a Q rating that's palatable to customer, generic, bland customer America who's not going to be offended by anything. And it's never the offensive lineman, to your point. CBS got rid of Boomer and Sims yesterday and replaced them with a younger Boomer in Matt Ryan. I would love to yeah. know the offers that Jason Kelsey uh, got before choosing that one. And I, this is another thing I'd love to know. If McAfee says and, and, and Peyton Manning say, hey, come over here, they're letting us run ESPN. Come over here. Come, come over here. They're letting us. The ESPN is going now into the star-making business. We're going to go $17 million personalities. We're going to help Shannon Sharp build his brand over well, it's here. it's not really star-making. It's like established stars. Right. Come here now. They used to be a star-making vehicle where people would ascend there, and there's still like a couple of outliers, but now it's just like we have a, a talent budget. They're going to the top line. Come over here, use I'd, us, I'd give you a card. I would love to know the bidding war that ESPN just won on Jason Kelsey. But do you guys think that Jason and Travis Kelsey need anyone? Do they need Omaha? Because they stand on their own, right? Oh, Travis but, but, is as Stugatz, big a star as anyone Stugatz, right Stugatz, now. Here's the thing, though, Stugatz, and this is the McAfee trade, man. He, he left FanDuel for less money but this, and it was deals with Iger. Like, it's not even Pitaro. Hey, Disney's president. You need real help in streaming. What are you going to do, worldwide leader? Oh, we're going to buy some stars. Here we go. We've got to get. We've got to make football bigger, bigger, bigger. We're we're fighting streaming wars now, and we're playing with Iger. the athletes have gotten to Iger Stugatz, and and Disney's in a crucial business time, and all of this is fascinating because it's a new game. And Jason Kelsey gets to play at the very top of it. He walks in through the front door and gets one of the best jobs, and it would have been the job of his choosing because Amazon would have wanted him. Everybody wants football. And uh, I know people get tired. Uh, our audience hates how interested I am in the media stuff. But if these guys are going to compete in business the way they did in sports, I want to watch that too. It might end us, then. No, that's, that's boring, that. just watching people compete in business. I'd rather them hit each other. Yeah, that's how we prefer them. Yeah. I mean, imagine them in suits just in a business room and you're watching them go back and back in negotiation and just doing that game where you write things on a piece of paper and slide it back and forth. A boring, boring thing to watch, I would think. Are you not interested in the mechanics of Man. what it is that the Kelseys are doing? I am a little fatigued that everybody just has to have a brand now. Why? Uh, that's why I, I just the more I watch this uh, Jokic guy, the more I uh, f with him. Mm. Hey, he's just going to go out there, roll the ball out. I don't care about a brand. I don't need a podcast. I just want to race my horses, do my damn thing. Yeah. I, I don't even like this sport. I'm <laughs> a brand. Get me the hell out of here. It's my brand. It's exhausting.
high schoolers come into like college universities and talk about their brand. But you isn't know. this what NIL is? I mean, this isn't going to get any It's just, it's well, it's, it's really, better. it's not even NIL. People want to blame that. It's, it's social media. You have to have a brand. If you're an athlete, you have to have, no, man, some, just get six rebounds a game, dude. Yeah. <laughs> like no, you you're you're a, a pull, you're a pulling guard. What are you what are you talking brand? Okay, I'll help you with your brand. That's what, Who that's was what that? we can do for you. Didn't Wimbayama just come up with a, a logo? Yeah, that's brand. Nike. Oh, that's, that's, what was yes. that name? Yeah. Nike. So you want Wim, to try Wimbanyama? Yeah, he's right. What did I say? Wimbanyama. Wemby. He, First time you kind of butchered it. it. Okay. Wemby. Well, uh, I, can you just play for me, please? Uh, the the music that just signals a little too late that uh, that people don't want to hear me talk about. <laughs> annoyed every time Dan Levitard pontificates about the sports media industry? Well, too bad, mother... He knows he don't give a damn about what he's gonna say. It's time for sports media talk today. I want to listen to some D'Angelo Russell sound. D'Angelo Russell betrayed us it's the other another brand. Day. Another brand. This Notice bra- a brand Kmart. What happened there? It's just why you know, are we rushing to be brands? I don't know. Toys are us. Specifically in my line Bed, of work, Bath and Beyond. Much of my day is just left sifting through like podcast pitches, and it's just like I don't have the heart to say like you're not a brand. You're a pivot midfielder for the New England Revolution. Like you're not a brand. <laughs> I could see where you would get tired of all of this, but I would assume that all of the things in athletic business are changing because every athlete subscribe to my Instagram package <laughs> and uh, and uh, X, I guess is what they're calling it. It's just two ninety nine. Right. Wow, and that well money done. goes directly in the pockets of women's basketball players here. So well, almost like you're a brand out. to their brands. I mean, if I have to leverage my brand to help their brands, <laughs> let's do it. D'Angelo Russell Stugatz, uh, last night, uh, he's been a very frustrating play- player for the Lakers. The other night we lost a Thursday Thunder because we had D'Angelo Russell getting 17 points or over, and he scored zero that night. And D'Angelo Russell was asked here, because he's going to leverage his situation, his brand, which is returning the Lakers, right? This brand left and now returns to the Lakers, and they cannot count on him at the end of LeBron James's career. But this is what he had to say in assessing his season, because these t- couple of sentences together, uh, the when I read them, I laughed out loud. Uh, just looking back on, on the totality of everything, how do you view this season and what you feel like you proved? Oh, hell of a year by D'Angelo. Um, Humbly saying that. (laughs) (laughs) Those two sentences back to back. Uh, Uh, (laughs) Hell of a year by D'Angelo. Third person on your own name. Uh, Humbly saying that. I love it. Come on. That's great. You can't. You can't. (laughs) You can. Oh, look, Taylor. That is Taylor. We've got to go. Taylor has now arrived finally in New York at Madison Square Garden after 28 hours. We go to Taylor. Look how happy he is. We go to Taylor next. Stugatz, I have asked the people who have been this far along on the journey with us to support the people who support us. And Game Time has been a very good sponsor to this show. They have taken Taylor, who is a Knicks fan, and uh, turned him into content. They have made him uh, somebody who, on behalf of Metal Arc Media, is riding through the swamp ass of the eastern seaboard in a train uh, to get to Madison Square Garden and a train station so that he can be foul and smelly around Joel Embiid this evening. Uh, it is a Knicks fan's dream and delight to be loud and proud on a train headed to support the Knicks tonight. It's called Penn Station. It's not your average train station. Okay, okay it's, it's Penn Station. All right, I but mean, it's ass. Uh, it uh, smells like ass train station. It's 28 <laughs> yes. hours. Uh, to, it's the Mecca. So yeah, it's, and it drops you off right there. It belches you out into uh, Madison Square Garden, where you can then heckle and and make fun of Joel Embiid. So Taylor has arrived. Our thanks to Game Time for making all of this happen. Uh, Taylor, uh, where are you? What are you doing? What are the stories from the trip that are worth telling? 28 hours on a train. Yeah, I am in Penn Station. Uh, Stu, I could kiss the ground right now, but you know how dangerous of a game that would be. Wouldn't do it. (laughs) Very, very dangerous game. I get on the train, and the first stop, there's nobody sitting next to me. The second stop, somebody gets on and sits next to me. I'm like, hey, where are you going? And this guy's like, I'm going all the way to New York. And I'm like, oh, my God. this is... It was 
worst case scenario, a guy sitting next to me the entire train ride. Uh, but every, along the way, Florence, South Carolina, Washington, D.C., people were stopping and really treating me like I was running a marathon, looking at them. And, uh, you know, a lot of them were saying, like, Taylor, you could do it. We believe in you. It, it felt a little <laughs> weird at times. Uh, <laughs> like fans of but, the show. <laughs> fans of the show are climbing aboard the train during stops and bringing you, like, snacks and support? Y yes, exactly. They're asking <laughs> me what kind of snacks I like when I'm going to be in their, in their city, they're tracking the trains uh, to see when my stop was going to come through their town. And some of these are, are like 2 a.m. In, in the middle of the night. Well, wait a minute. How, um, much time so do, how, much, how much time do they have with you at each stop? Do they just run in and give you like some goldfish and then run out? It, it feels like when you see like a garbage guy going through a town where it's like he gets off, he puts the garbage and he's, he's still the, tr the truck is still moving. He's got to jump back on. That's what it felt like at times. Uh, and I, I tried to I tried to talk to them for for a bit. Uh, but then somebody from the train would be like, hey, you got you got to get back on. And I think everybody's <laughs> great out. Kind of looking right so, out. It's why, why? so it's literally Taylor Swiftly. It's, it's, it's as quickly as we can do this. You have to get back on the train. Nice meeting you. Yes. I was only here for four minutes on my way to 28 hours elsewhere. Yeah, and a lot of people were looking at me like, why is this guy getting off the train? And, and who are these people? Because you're a big celebrity. No, him? who's getting off at 2 a.m.? They think you're a drug mule along the eastern <laughs> seaboard. That you're, that you're, you've got these choreographed stops where people are handing you boxes. You're being arrested by a bunch of teams when you arrive yeah. at Madison Square Garden. Yeah, and, and the guy who was sitting next to me on the plane was like, yeah, I'm afraid of flying, so I was just vacationing in Orlando. So I'm coming back to New York and he was like, what are you doing? And I'm like, how, how much time do you have? It's kind of a long story, kind of a weird story. Nothing, nothing really makes sense about it, but bad news for Joel Embiid. I, I made it. <laughs> yeah, do you have anything left, Taylor? Are your legs going to be underneath you today? Because they're going to need every ounce of that energy. And once again, thank you to Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use a code Trip from Hell. For $20 off your first purchase, terms apply. Game Time was very kind to send Taylor to Madison Square Garden via train. I was told. Yeah, my biggest. That was, that was, yeah, a, that was a question for Taylor. Oh, sorry. No, I was told as part of his penance was he doesn't have a room. So are you just wandering the streets from now until game time? I'm from New York, so a, a little bit outside the city. So I'm going to have to try to figure out how to, how to meet up uh, with my parents later. I'm going to send a few texts to Pablo, see if I could shower at Pablo's. Uh, um, <laughs> we couldn't get your hotel room? The answer is no from Pablo, just Seriously. so you know. <laughs> Listen, there's a Blarney Stone a couple of blocks away. Go there. Uh, tell Jimmy Stugat sent you. He'll have you spend the entire day there. He'll make you some soup. It will be a great time. Or you can go to the Hort, which is right down the block. You tell Mikey there that Stugat sent you. You're good. Baked clams. Uh, Fantastic. Taylor, do me a favor. Taylor. Do this and record it. Uh, yep. Say that all again, please. Do do this. Uh, try and get what you, what Stugatz is promising you, and and take take me where that journey the, ends the up. The big clam specifically. Uh, yes. The heart, which is right down the block. That's Mikey. Tom yeah. Stugatz sent you great baked clams. I recommend the cheeseburger, perhaps the two dogs and French fries. Very good. Okay, not dirty water dogs. You can get those anywhere. These are heart but what, dogs. But what, okay? what's Mikey going to do for him? Well, Mikey will take care of him. Treat I mean, him like a, a king. He'll have a place to stay the entire time. I believe there's a shower at the heart, uh, so you'll be able to <laughs> shower there. And then you have the Blarney Stone just a couple of okay, blocks but away. You're, you're offering Taylor. He's saying it's going to shower at Pablo's. You're, I'm you, offering him a roof. I mean, that's what I'm doing. You're offering him lodging. Well, and alcohol. Yeah. Food yeah. and lodging. Yes, and friends and conversation. Yeah. Should you be doing that on behalf of somebody without checking with them first? Well, let me talk to Mikey. Tom Stagat sent you. See how it goes. I trust. I trust you. There you go. All right. My, my, big, my biggest worry is that I've slept maybe in like 30 minute increments for, for the entire 28 hour trip that I'm going to be so tired that I fall asleep before the game and, and miss the game completely. You, uh, you, so I'm going to have to set a to, lot of alarms. You weren't able to sleep on the train? Very few and far between. Uh, you uh, any other highlights worth reporting? No, the train ride was for for all the little people. Everybody who who doubted, everybody yes. who said I couldn't do something. Yes. Uh, so 
Thank you. Thank okay. you, everybody. An Thank you, Game Time. Okay. A champion. An, an underdog acceptance to there. from oh. Taylor. Oh, uh, we, Taylor need the six, we need the Sixers to win today. A tonight. real hero. Taylor's a real hero on behalf of his Knicks. What did he do? Well he just sat there for 28 hours. <laughs> he did have to talk to somebody <laughs> like that the guy whole chirping time. At him. <laughs> That's <laughs> real bad. He, he sat there and alerted the authorities. Did you trade the... contact info? You don't tell that guy your destination. What you do to get rid of him is say, hey, this is my stop. You get out. You get on a different cart. I mean, that's what you do. Okay, but they're assigned seats. I mean, really? You still have no one's wallet. paying attention. Okay, yeah, stunning that Stugatz would be a train you expert. sit where yes. you want. I okay, mean. good talk, GA. Stugatz. I'm glad that you would provide uh, excellent analysis of GA on a train for 28 hours. <laughs> Don't know the last time you've been on a train. Don't want to talk to you about this anymore. <laughs> Taylor, thank you for being on with us. It's us. Excellent. Right. Good dismount. Dismount. Excellent. Say hi to Mikey. Was, oh, was that the promo code you were trying to say? <laughs> Trip from hell. <laughs> Trip from hell. There it is. Just a skew. I love that as the end of the video. Just a train station. A heroic finish to a heroic trip. 28 hours where he just sat his ass on a train. It would be unpleasant. We're all agreeing with that, right? I, I, there, there are very few circumstances, if you're not in a room that has a bed in it or something, that sitting on a train for 28 hours isn't going to be unpleasant, right? No, it sounds very un uh, unpleasant, and kudos to Taylor. The, the Knicks mean that much to him that he would pitch this idea himself. <laughs> to I want, get some airtime. Come on, we know what's going yes, on there. We but, all we, know. but this was good. So pretty much now the bar is he's he's either got to be on a speedboat That's right. or a ride or ride up the entire eastern seaboard via train. <laughs> and we actually like the proof's in the pudding. Solid segments. I want to well one memorable segments. One of them uh, derailed our relationship with the Daily Show, uh, but memorable segments nonetheless. Uh, the the thing I wanted to ask you guys because um, I know a lot of people object to me, quote unquote, talking politics or being about politics when yesterday is about as sportsy of a show as we've ever done, because I also like sports, uh, but I am interested in the human condition and not politics. But I saw here a story, and let's just take the politics out of it for a second, because um, a South Dakota governor, put it on the poll, Juju, at Lebetard Show, have you ever met somebody from South Dakota? I have not. Hmm. at Levitard show. Have you ever met someone from South Dakota? But uh, South Dakota governor, Christy Noem, is, was being talked about or is being talked about as a vice presidential candidate for Donald Trump. And I don't want to get into everything that will be happening in 2024 as we try to distract ourselves with sports during a poisoned election year where we're really choosing between two old people, uh, who don't represent uh, the, the the best of what you'd want for our future in leadership just because they're in real... I don't mean to be ageist about this, but uh, it, we can do better in terms of declining mental facilities on both counts. And everything that you're seeing in front of you uh, has a lot of poison in it. And Christy Noem is now uh, under duress because... Do you guys know this story? Uh, she has written in a book, evidently, that she had a dog, a 14-month-old dog, uh, who uh, was named Cricket. And uh, Cricket evidently uh, ate up like a neighboring chicken pen. <laughs> and so in proving that she's what America needs for the future and how tough she is to get messy and ugly, uh, she uh, took Cricket, a uh, 14-month-old dog, out and shot it, killed it, uh, and did it herself. And uh, people are arguing about this, whether this is fit for leadership or not. And it just got me to thinking about everything that happened with Michael Vick and how Michael Vick is. Uh, him and Craig Carton are the only ones who are allowed to come back from felony to doing sports media and having public voice. Um, Michael Vick couldn't have expected whatever was coming with him uh, from dog lovers. But when you guys hear this, just this, take the politics out of it. And just make what it is I am the story. When you hear somebody does that to a 14-month-old dog for being a dog, and the dog incidentally also bit her. So uh, for if you don't think dogs deserve anything and should be shot, maybe you are out there. But you hear that story. And as an animal lover, I just recoil. So you hear that story. The rest of the group hears that story and does what with it? Yeah, it's a terrible story. I mean, you don't shoot a dog under any circumstances, I don't think, unless it is 
grievously harmed a human being and is just. Have you a, seen the movie Cujo? A ra- That's certainly a, a circumstance. A rabbit. You dog had to shoot that. Dog. You had to shoot. Yeah, yeah you had to shoot. There was okay. no option. Right. Okay, that's fine. It did happen a long time ago. It happened like ten or twelve years ago, which I think is a mitigating factor a little bit. I don't know what her state of mind was at that time, but it was a hunting dog that was apparently a terrible hunting dog. Okay, so instead of shooting it. You know, give it to somebody well, who's well, going to raise it a as puppy. a pet. It's a puppy. It needs to be trained. It's right. a puppy. Yeah, and it's a very trainable breed, the German short-haired pointer. My neighbors had German short-haired pointers. I knew the breed quite well. Wonderful dog. But Strange if wheelhouses today. That and the 1973 <laughs> wife sn- swap. Yeah. <laughs> Strange in, places for you to have expertise. You know what? As an 18-year-old, I was the youngest <laughs> official scorer in professional baseball nationwide. That's amazing. It's incredible when yes. I think back to it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's yeah. amazing. It's been a lovely cruise. It has been a lovely cruise. Yeah. In fact, Pete Ward, um, who was the manager of the Fort Lauderdale Yankees at one time, called mm. up to the press box to try to get me to switch one of my calls so that one of his pitchers would get a no-hitter. But that's that's a whole different story. Right. I would never shoot a this dog. This is a new and unimproved Dan Lebedar show with the Stugats. Gamble on by DraftKings. I am, uh, <laughs> I don't think, I don't think we've had a lot of hard network outs better than that one. Now, I know that the, the hard network out has been a little inconsistent lately, but uh, I will assure everyone listening to this that Greg Cody is never in on the joke. Never, ever in on the joke. It infuriates him. He uh, still doesn't understand it. I believe the best one ever, the best one ever was this one. I don't think this one can be topped. Me, Dan, everyone, we told you repeatedly to go to the doctor. You ignored us. You finally uh, went to the doctor, and the results of your visit to the doctor were were what? Yeah, after several tests, um, they found a tumor in my chest. Uh, it's Dan, Stu, and Greg Cody on ESPN Radio. <laughs> it wasn't, now, this, what just happened wasn't quite that good. Um, it wasn't quite that good. But do you want to take me through what it is that just happened to you? Because you kept talking after the break. Yeah. and But we had already clipped you at, uh, what was it that you said? That you, uh, I'd never, I would never shoot a dog. <laughs> a non sequitur, a non sequitur from what it is that you had been talking about. Uh, I can't remember where, I think I was talking about uh, official scoring, right? As an 18-year-old. The, the, no, you were talking about, the, the place that I was hoping that story would go is you would tell us whether that bribe worked or not. But you no. segued without any warning or, uh, you segued as if you saw the hard network out coming and needed a funny joke to get before the one second. I, you know, I can't remember going from one to the other. I, I could would, they have bribed you? No, they couldn't have, of course not. And Pete Ward would never do that. Went on to have a decent career as a uh, Chicago White Sox third baseman, infield, corner infielder. But I think that was before his manager. Why are you career. telling us this? Ah, you know, people care. A lot of Pete Ward fans out there. He tried to bully you into a no-hitter. Yeah, he called. He I, called up to the press box. He was suggesting. Right? I think he knew that I was very young. But right. I, as I was saying off air, uh, the, the older gentleman who was the scoreboard operator and another older gentleman who was the announcer – I would consult them because I'm 18 years old. Sure. If it's a close call, I'm like, hey, you guys see that as a hit like I do? Right. And, and so I believe we were all in a simpatico on, on this call. Pete Ward did not agree with it. I don't recall him yelling or threatening. I just recall him. Thank you for bringing that yeah. story back to light all these years yeah, later, giving us all yeah. the details that Pete, the Pete Ward details that no one knew to have or cared to have. That's exactly right. What if old Pete Ward pulled out a C note? You give him a no hitter, or uh, I'd probably negotiate. Up. <laughs> There's no amount of bribe that would have gotten you, an 18 year old Greg Cody, to change his call. No, no, uh, no, I'm a man of integrity. All right, the thing I wanted to ask the group here because Jerry Seinfeld is now going viral, Stugatz, and uh, you know that I like to talk about uh, the the climate that the funny people find themselves in. Jerry Seinfeld is close to 70, 70 years old. Jerry Seinfeld, uh, comedy tends to age poorly, generally, and I understand in the climate of today why comedians, even the greatest, 
like him would look at what's happening around comedy and not like how stifling it is. So I want to, as, as someone who has deeply admired uh, Seinfeld's choices, Dugat, because he just quit with the best television show and then made a really other cool television mm -hmm. show, doesn't have to do anything else, and makes funny things. His stand-up special is, uh, when he travels the world, it is a comedian's comedian stand-up. Even if it's about nothing, the comedy is expert. You are watching a craftsman who, who, who all the other comedians want to please because he is the king of, yeah, I took this thing that is the hardest thing. You don't get any health benefits. It's just you and you're funny, the expectation of funny. And I turned it into, I've got studios filled, airplane hangers filled with cars. I love classic cars. I'm a monster success. And then my co-creator goes and creates another show for 12 years that is one of the best shows that never runs out of material, that honors the first show. The run of television over 25 years there. You're not going to find anything like it. Those guys are comedy gods. But Jerry Seinfeld, like a lot of comedians, even the ones who would tell you the way to handle today's cancel culture is be a better comedian. Be better at right. comedy. Don't complain about people getting offended. Just be better at comedy. Here's Jerry Seinfeld giving voice to something that is aging out in America. It's aging out in funny. It's aging out. And it feels threatened because... Young people have a different standard, and they'd like their comedy sometimes to be a little more polite, a little more decent. Nothing really affects comedy. People always need it. They need it uh, so badly, and they don't get it. It used to be you would go home at the end of the day. Most people would go, oh, Cheers is on. Oh, MASH is on. Oh, Mary Tyler Moore is on. All in the Family's on. You just expect it. There'll be some funny stuff we can watch on TV tonight. Well, guess what? Where is it? This is the result of the extreme left and PC crap and people worrying so much about offending other people. Mm -hmm. When you write a script and it goes into four or five different hands, committees, groups, here's our thought about this joke, well, that's the end of your comedy. They move the gates, like in skiing. Yeah. Culture, the gates are moving. Your job is to be agile and clever enough that wherever they put the gates, I'm going to make the gate. And he is, and he has been. He hasn't had very much in the way of ever stepping in it. And it can be said again, Larry David has navigated this course for 12 years since Seinfeld and has done it wildly successfully and has done it without any issues. Uh, but that would be politically on the other side. What Seinfeld is saying there is different than what Larry David has been. I don't think Larry David complains about PC culture, does he? I don't think so. It was also interesting that he singled out the left instead of the right or both or neither. Um, but, but I think he's right. I mean, nowadays you have to be so careful about what you say and who's in the audience and whether they're going to heckle you. I think heckling is back with stand-up comics now because you're going to offend somebody by saying just about anything, in, unless it's benign is heckling observational back? humor. Is heckling back? Uh, are you making the announcement that not only the Panthers are going to win the Stanley Cup, but right. are you also <laughs> making the <laughs> yes. announcement that heckling is up at comedy clubs? Heckling, heckling is, is back. back. Yes, I am making that announcement from observation. I am. My I, observation is that comedy is having a real renaissance period right now, and everyone is getting over on the fact that there's this presumed boogeyman of PC culture. I mean, making fun of the culture has been hugely financially rewarding mm -hmm. for all these big top-line comics that if there were actually these things in place that were out there to cancel them effectively wouldn't be as huge as they are right now. It's just it's a very convenient argument and it's almost as if the industry has to keep propping that up because it goes directly into their wallet if you have this renegade stand-up comedian that goes at that notion. It, it pays to be Andrew Schultz. It pays to uh, – they are they are filling out arenas right now no, all that, over that the is place. Mainstream, mainstream comedy right now is to openly – have open disdain for this presumed villain, this foil – of the art of stand-up comedy. And right now in my lifetime, stand-up comedy has never been hotter. But I would say there is a foil, though. The foil, though, the thing that is happening with what Seinfeld is saying, Stugatz, that is both right and wrong, is there is 
a whole bunch of comedians, Mike was lamenting brands before, who have their own counterculture thing, who, who might be too hot for everything else in America, who are absolutely using corporate control, Andrew Schultz among them, uh, as the new thing to say the way people used to complain about just the media and everyone can get behind, yeah, the media. The idea that corporations are trying to control, though, they are. That's not false. Like yeah, they, they, they are. There are more hands in this right. pot uh, telling comedians or trying to tell everybody what to do than there have ever been. Aggressive. And they all have mid- Netflix specials. Middle, but mid- that works middle managers. The, right. but that they, works to the comedian's advantage, though. They it gives have, them a foil. It gives yeah. them something no, to rail these, against. These, yes. these big-time companies uh, that are standing in the way of progress and, and actual true comedy. Let me work with Netflix. <laughs> it's, you know, it's... It's just, it's a little hypocritical, like we can all see through it, and it's great for the industry to keep that you're, perception you're saying, out there. I don't there. think people see that. Mike, I think that there's saying. a real difference between, say, what Chappelle was doing over the course of, and I don't want to rehash it, over the course of three stand-up specials where he, one of the great communicators of our time struggled to get a joke across the line, and just, you know, saying like, what, I can't make fun of unibrows anymore? It's it's just a little little bit different, but it's all good. The tide has has been raised by whether we like it or not or agree with it or not, the perception is reality. And the tide has been raised because all these talented comedians are having a go at it. I don't think most people see it, though. I don't think that most people understand that it is at least a thriving time in comedy because Louis C.K. can exist in a place amid all these other podcasts where it feels like they're too hot for the mainstream and they continue to feed their brand as the only places that you can get Louis C.K. That's why it's intellectually lazy to just label everything cancel culture culture or previously and i know seinfeld's trying to bring it back like what's referred to as politically correct behavior because it's not a catch-all there there is a difference between what louis ck did and then having to go at an overweight audience as a part of the crowd work in your act like it, it's just it's just different but it all gets to say someone's out to get me and everyone loves even when they're not you know at a central casting looking like a victim it is very popular in today's day and age. It's a brand okay. to play the victim. Okay, Mike, you're more of a consumer of stand-up comedy than I am, so I'm going to ask you this. But you just announced that heckling is back. I believe heckling is back, yes. I think I, heckling's back, too. I can't, <laughs> because I can't stand-up comedy it. is back, because right. more people are going to see stand-up comedy shows, so you'll see but, more. But here's heckling. my question. Is, you're, you're implying that there's some renaissance and big comeback for stand-up comedy. I would suggest there's just more stand-up comics who are feeding on the fact that there's a hunger for content. We see it in sports, and we're also seeing it in comedy, where there's so so much streaming and so many opportunities to, to have oh. televised stand-up comedy. Yeah, but I think it's concrete It's concrete data. Like Netflix is spending more on these specials. Comedians are, are really enjoying the fruits of their labor in ways, and it was in many ways it was brought about because of the pandemic, because these people were out there, people were stuck to their devices, stuck in their homes. And a lot of comedians, Andrew Schultz, chief among them, I think, and Joe Rogan, were – speaking in real time to a crisis of people's lives and because of that people turned were binging stand-up specials and found more out things like tiktok and ig reels their podcast clips yeah that dude the pandemic also helped and this whole culture of some of it legitimate but this thing that is standing in the way of you laughing and having a good time and in your time out it all mixed up into this amazing stew that's making a lot of people a lot of money. A thing that's not real. They they exist with great freedom to laugh at everybody. Or maybe I fainted. I woke up confused today. This is a lie. I want to shout out Yeti and Andrew Streeter for all the fine work that they do for our show and for the Greg Cody featuring Greg 
Cody show. Yeah, with thank okay. you. Fine. Um, Greg they, Cody they, they show dropped... featuring Greg Cody. Right. No. Not with Greg, not Greg with. Cody. That's my show. apologies. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, okay. I screwed that up. Right. Yeah, it's with. So it's a Greg Cody show featuring Greg Cody. No, with. 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 Lines. Right, with. I don't know what what it is. I can't get that one down. Uh, you know, I'd have to have a pretty big ego to feature myself on my own show. It's with. With. Well, it was a great day for songs on the show. Why? And I that Chris Cody playing that great song gave us all the excuse that we need, I think, to relive one of my favorite songs that I've heard on this show in recent memory, the Me Maximum song. <laughs> Me Maximum. Me Maximum. Me Maximum. Heck yeah. Greg is king and you're his peasants. Me Maximum. Heck yeah. My way is the only way. Yeah. If we share a hotel room, you know who you answer to. Me Maximum. Oh, you. My comfort is of most importance. Me Maximum. Oh, you. Say it again so they can hear it in the back. Yeah. That's so ridiculous. We you don't love often it. do hard rock. We don't we don't often do aggressive aggressive. Soup of the day. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of thing. And you know it. Pride of a lion. Boat shoe. Miller Lion. In my garage. All night. Falling down. Getting hurt. That kind of thing. (laughs) Do you have a back in my day today? Of course. You know better than that. It's it's heat playoff. Yeah. Plus I've had a serious injury. It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. No, but it's Tuesday in the midst Mm -hmm. of heat. Play, uh, Panthers playoff. Right? I the only other time I think that we have done an aggressive <laughs> song off the top of my head, do because aggressive is hard. That was Mike. That Mike, you did Pouncy Block. I want to revisit Pouncy Block real quick because going and summoning the stuff that you have to do the aggressive versions of this song makes it hard. I don't think many many have tried it very much. So I just want to go back to uh, reminding everyone of that time that the Dolphins thought they were going to win a game and then the Jets, <laughs> Darrell Rivas had a pick six and Mike Pouncey was chasing him and for reasons that were unbeknownst to everybody when he realized he wasn't going to catch him he just did a somersault and D- Darrell Rivas ran 100 <laughs> yards in the other direction. And for some reason this Mike ma- made Mike Ryan do ACDC Greg Cody, I've been remiss today. I owe the apology uh, to the audience for a couple of things. One, I keep confusing you when I say the local hour is a different time than you expected. I'm sorry that I keep doing that. <laughs> Two, I want to uh, apologize because we have not gotten to any of your draft coverage. You are a draft expert. You had, again, more exactos, more zagakis than anyone <laughs> except for a handful of people who had more. And uh, Name you, them. Uh, Peter Schrager. Yep. 
Really? How many? He is he claiming have? he had the most exactos of anyone who was doing mock drafts. And how many would that be? I'm reading the story right now, but it seems to appear like Greg. I'm looking at it right now. He had J.J. McCarthy to the Vikings, and he had Bo Nix to the Broncos. I did too. You had both those guys. Mm-hmm. Oh, he wow. did. Yeah. I'm sorry. Back off. The Vikings Mr. one was I'm just, though. I'm just pointing it, it out. Why don't Shrakes. you know? Why don't you know what Greg has? Mm. There, there was some question, I believe, and I could be wrong about the Vikings and J.J. McCarthy because Greg had the player going to the team, but at a different pick. Because if you remember, the Vikings traded up, so there was kind of some confusion as to how that. Oh, one that's. Would count. I could see Greg making that an exacto. I can see, or as a gacky. I could see him making that as a gacky just because he got it in the right uh, number, but not the right team. Okay, there's a. a, a Is there a controversy no, the around way. this? He got the right team, but the wrong number because the Vikings traded up. Correct. An exacto is the right player to the right team mm. in the first round. Okay. Oh. <clears throat> and the, now a super exacto. Wait a minute. What? A super, super exacto. Yeah, no, keep up. Yeah. Exactly That's right. what a Zagacto is. No, 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 no. Super exacto. Yeah. Super exacto is a Zagacto. Yeah. You guys are confusing. Oh, no, you guys, Greg, come on. It's a different weight class. Zagacto or a Zagacki? Yeah. What's the best this of the three? It's already confusing enough. It's no, no, no. It's a Zagacki. It's a Zagacto. Let Greg speak. You are. It's a fine. What is the best of them? What is a super Zagacto? Wait a minute. What? You just added super to this. Let's start again. You know that you just added super to this to make it extra confusing. No, no, no. There's Exacto, okay. super exacto. I didn't exacto, even know what an exacto, exacto and a zigacto was. Hear the man out. Exactly. Okay, right. let's let him talk. A super exacto, that- mm-hmm. aka zigacto, mm-hmm. is right player to what? right team in exact yeah. order. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Super you, zigacto. you said that there is a super zigacto. That's different well, than a super zigacto. Uh, Zagacto is a super exacto. When is there a, a super zigacto is different. What, what is a super zigacto? A super zagacto is the right player to the right team in the exact order. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, that's yes. so rare yeah. with especially because you'd have to factor in trades and everything, mm-hmm. which is just It's a rare, hellscape. but you got the first four this a, year. A super yes. exacto, yes. a super exacto is or getting Zagacto. JJ McCarthy to the Vikings at eleven because they've traded up. Right. That would be that's you've you've never done a super exacto. You didn't have a okay. trade knowing a trade. Have you ever had? Has there been? It's a unicorn. A oh, super yeah, exacto. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have nine exactto's. Eight of them are super exacto's mm-hmm. wow. or zagacto's. Yes. Mm. The only exception, the only ordinary exacto I have, uh, is is McCarthy because I had him going to Minnesota in the original fifth spot. Eleventh or eleventh. Eleventh. Um, hmm. But they traded up and ended up getting him 10th. I'm seeing here Schrager had 12 team player matches in the Woo! first round. Okay, I had because none. of trades, they know like he didn't necessarily hit all of them in the right selection spot. Right. It was a great mock. He had chop going to the Dolphins. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, but, so, okay. but yeah. in fair, he works for the NFL, so uh, okay. I, he had tw- he so know? he has inside information. Yeah, awesome. no, there, there was yeah. a there was a profile done on right. him that says nobody works the bar at the combine better than Peter. Wow. Schreiber. Yeah, well, I've wow. seen him there. You know, I go to the combine all the time. That's When's true. the last time you were at the film? combine? Um, like seriously. <laughs> Name have the bar. Ever, have you ever he's been to the here. combine? <laughs> he's not here to be crazy. I think I might have gone Greg, to the combine once. Greg can tell you one thing about all of downtown Indianapolis. St. <laughs> Elmo's. Elmo's. Oh that's my all God. he can tell you. Mm-hmm. That's is where everything cocktail. happens. And yes. that's shrimp cocktail. That's it. That's the only the thing he can. So- the that's, hot he sauce. He can't tell you oh. anything else. But there, there, there are scouts there. And that is where the NFL goes to dine. Yes. Where the NFL goes to dine. <laughs> That's the only place. That's, and Schrager will work that room. You know what? I give Schrager credit. It's tough getting 12. I had nine. Mm-hmm. Junior only had eight. Yeah. But and is your analysis only going to be how many you got right and others got right? Or are you going to have good football analysis that people are going to want or just self-involved meandering? It's mostly self-involved meandering. Mm-hmm. But here's, my, here's the thing, okay, and I'm being very honest right now. The reason that I can even compete with a Kuiper is that those guys overanalyze. They get so much information overload. They're hearing from so many people. They don't know what to do at the end of the day. Okay, I don't have that problem. I have uh, my picks. Are you streamline the, it. You, you take, have plenty yeah, of problems. You take all of their mock yeah, drafts. And you dealt with off the field stuff that none exactly of them had to right. deal with. Yeah. This is exactly right. Adversity. Yeah, it's hard to get Zagactos, and it's even more difficult. 
to get playoff tickets. As you know, the secondary market, there's all sorts of fees, <laughs> prices. I was just going to do mean, this for you. Up, I was just down, get all you around. <laughs> but you say it's hard. I've heard there's an easy way to do there it, There is. Mike. There is. And What's let that? me tell you the easiest way. It's to download the Game Time app, Billy. Create an account. Have you done this yet? I have. You have. And yeah. you have you use promo code Dan? I forgot. Well, <laughs> use promo code Dan. And I was kicking myself. For $20 Whoa. off your first purchase, terms apply, last-minute tickets. I love the technology within this app because you could look to your left, look to your right. You could see all that from your from your seat. Lowest price, guaranteed. Great customer service. I've been in a pickle once before. Uh, customer service got back to me like that. I got my money back. And then some Everywhere in the guarantee. world, customer service sucks. Not at game oh, time. No. Right. Everywhere else, customer service is bad. Everywhere else. Not at game time. Yep. The only place to figure it out how to make customer service good. That's my opinion. That's not part of the copy. That's not just your opinion. That's a fact. Guaranteed. I'm downloading the game time app right now. That's not guaranteed or a fact. You don't know how to do look that. Look at him. Look at him. You know, look, look at what he's doing. He's just pawing. Promo code D A N. And on your first purchase, you get $20 off. Billy, how could you forget to use the promo code? I'm a numbskull. Do better, Flash Billy. Pricing. Yeah. Do better. Sometimes the, the prices go down the closer you get to tip off. It's true. I wrote a book. That's an unbelievable. We won't do better than that today. We won't. I wrote a book. I mean, Greg's H and O is pretty great, though. I wrote a book. Yeah. Why wouldn't you concede that there is absolutely zero difference between a super exacto and a zagacto, which is why the zagacto name was coined? If Mike, there's, there's no difference. such thing what as a super exacto, it just mm. became a zagacto. He okay. just made it up. It was no. unbelievable. Oh, oh we were already confused and by it. And then he no. said that there was a super zagacto. Okay. He never once explained what a super zagacto is. He is saying the exacto is just matching up the player um, and the team. I know what it is. but then The he's, super exacto is getting the trade, getting the, the order correct. But that's a zagacto. No. But he even said in the thing. He admitted it. They're one in the same. He said same. AKA. He said AKA. Right, exactly. That means otherwise known as. But he confused right. the process by saying the super exacto is a zagacto. Just use zagacto. And then he opened up a whole new can of worms by saying that there was a super zagacto. When he started explaining it, it was the very definition of zagacto. There was nothing no. super about it. It's no. a nickname for the super exacto mm -hmm. is zagacto. Yes, exacto. but you said that there was a super zagacto. There is. If you call the triple play a zagacto, you're not wrong. Correct. Although right. technically Correct. it's called the super the super exact. Yes, but yeah. where did the super zagacto come from? That is not a thing. No, no it is. It, it, no, because the super exacto is a zagacto. Yes, but yes. you said that there was a super zagacto. I, there may, is. I may have misspoken. Okay. Oh, well, finally. <laughs> I, know. I, know. Finally. What? I was hey, defending hey, you. Hey, I'm he, speaking for the audience he, here. He also may have not have misspoken. That's true, right. too, but I, yeah. I thought he just opened Thank up you. a portal to a whole new world that we didn't know about. We were all ready to run after him, but he just misspoke. So, is a Me super maximum. zagacto like a run of three straight zagactos? No, it's not sequential order. No. Anyway. No. It just exists, anyway. but there's right. nothing to assign it to. I want to, uh, before we get out of here. Did today, you just shrug at me? I mean, he's trying to get a word in. Yeah, it's right. Dan's That's show. Let him yeah, talk. He's trying yeah, to move please. things along here. Right. Right. But I do think he just misspoke instead of opening a portal no. to a new world of Zagak. But <laughs> being such a man and just saying, you know what? You got me there. I misspoke. No, you didn't get me there. I wrote the book. Oh, they just spoke. We're back. I wrote the yes. book on Zagacto. Come mm -hmm. on. And on Quasi. You can't say I misspoke. <laughs> Maybe I misspoke. And then, what is it? Say, take a stand. In the immortal words of Edwin Pope, my mentor, you may be right. Mm. <laughs> you either misspoke or you spoke. Mm -hmm. Make up your mind. No. It's, you misspoke. It, it, it can be both. It can, How? It can, it can be yeah. both. It can He's be. right no, about no, that. No, 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 no. Look at here. Look at here. Junior. Okay. Hey, Drifter. Okay, exactly. <laughs> I ain't cheating. Well said. <laughs> Super exacto and <laughs> zagacto yep. are synonyms. They yes, we established that. Thing. But then you again. You said the there, was gripe, there was a super zigzag. There was a super zigzag. I don't remember hearing it that <laughs> yeah, way. Yeah, you can AKA. say you yeah. can say super zagacto. Ain't no log in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can say that. You tell them. Okay, the, it's no problem. The thing that I wanted uh, to discuss very quickly here, just before we get out of here, Stugatz, because playoff basketball, as it changes and morphs into whatever America is going to be consuming in 10 years 
frustrated with the three pointers, frustrated with, oh my God, Wembenyama ruined everything. I don't understand what I'm watching. I don't like it anymore. Foreigners or whatever's going to happen to the <laughs> N NBA in the next 10 years. I just want to stop for a moment, for just a moment, to witness a passing of the guard in the NBA that allows us to celebrate all the amazing things that LeBron James has been as an unprecedented athlete in sports for 15 years, to get knocked out by a champion from war-torn, a joyless, <laughs> war-torn, scarred ogre who has changed everything about how people understood basketball because nobody wanted him, and now he's dominating the sport to watch the change in that sport from, okay, the stories are going to change now. All the old guys have to go, and you might be less interested because you don't like basketball as much, and you like stars, and the old guys are gone now. You like Steph, and you like LeBron, and you like, you like the players you liked. But you like new stars. NBA fans you have like to, new yep, stars. You have to love basketball, Stu Gutson. What I'm talking about is making your league palatable to everyone and growing it over years with streaming services, partnering up for the next 10 years of the league because you, please, it, please do not disrespect what these men have done in carrying this league and evolving it during the age of player empowerment so it could be what it is now. And after Michael. Correct. Yes. Uh, but in the age of LeBron James is handing over the torch – and the old guys are giving over the league to here come the stories. And I want it to be other something other than Denver because it'll get droning if he gets to do Why the Why is that? Because the style of play that he has is actually very unique for the league. And if you're a part of the uh, NBA sports fandom chapter that – has a, an issue with how the game's all threes and whatnot. He, he has elements of that in his game, but he plays a very old-school game. I would say to you that, generally speaking, when people uh, think about their attachments to the sport, it is high-flying athleticism. Yes. It is uh, soaring. It, yeah. is, it is flight. It's that, Michael. It's Dr. Yeah. J. That, which is being taken away by everyone hanging around it's Kobe. The, the but, perimeter. But, and, and you can make yourself a legend as a Paul Pierce or a Larry Bird with a game that we don't talk totally understand but flight athletics anthony edwards is 20 shea gilgis alexander i can't believe how what fast can't that guy he, do how fast he is uh and they're fighting an ogre they're they're fighting someone we don't understand the ogre has some good athletes I, his teammates I, no I under, mean, understood right. but what i'm saying to you is you've got a cement mixer moving through the lane <laughs> that is that doesn't turn the ball over and it seems fundamentally immune to the fact that there are helicopters swooning around his face. There's no real hole in his game at all. None. There isn't. Nothing. Yeah. There, you, nothing. Can't send, you can't send him to the line. You could say defense if you want. You could say not enough of a rim protector, but offensively, as an offensive player, he just knocked out the best. And yeah. I don't want to leave yesterday without knowing, without everyone sort of genuflecting on the fact that the oldest player in the league gets an eliminated last night what it takes is a champion. It's two points, and still we're all like, yeah, Lakers, you probably need to draft Bronny and keep that because I think the next two years of that, he's going to try and keep getting into the championship game. He's not going to just let the young people have his sport. It's interesting because the Lakers actually have, I think, three first-round picks and plenty of cap space, yet he is not giving any indication whether or not he's going to be there. It's going to be another right. fun offseason of LeBron, and he can dominate the transaction while making Hollywood movie deals, but the league that he no longer presides over as the king because he, do he doesn't get to be the king anymore, Stugat. He would in New York. Yeah. Did you know that Magic Cavs is tied at two? Yeah. There was a game three over the weekend that I was sure was game three, but apparently that was game four. Yep. I miss game three entirely. Big game five tonight, NBA TV. The swing game. <laughs> I found out yesterday. Where, where? When did this game happen? I'm, I'm certain it happened on NBA TV, but I missed it. I was so sad. I was so sad on Saturday driving around. Listening on the radio oh, wow. to the Cavs score 10 third quarter points <laughs> against the Magic. Magic down oh, nine I, at the half. I, Thunder back. I watched that. I was sad about my life. Uh, I just had no idea it was to bring the, the series level. Totally missed the third game. <laughs>